Hello and welcome to another session in our series, Architecture and Philosophy. This is part of the uh, uh, doctoral consortium, uh, something that we set on digital futures with the idea of pooling resources. Um, it, it, these days with the possibility of, of coming together online, it doesn't seem to make so much sense anymore to be meeting in small groups uh, with individual professors in small classrooms and we can have a single platform where we can share, we can share these ideas and bring together um, some of the best professors in the world to, um, uh, to to really uh, uh, to 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 put together an archive of of, of interesting and important material uh, on the subject of architecture and philosophy. The, one of the ideas behind this is that actually there are very few uh, um, uh, videos, recordings of some of the thinkers that we are addressing in this in the particular series. And the idea is to 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 get together some of the experts who can really comment on this as secondary sources and really uh, provide a really useful resource um, available for free for everyone around the world. Um, so today we'll be dealing um, with Donna Haraway, someone who actually straddles both sides of what we've been dealing, dealing with the past few weekends, that is to say, the world of technology, of advanced technology, and uh, the world of, of philosophy. Um, this is then, it's going to be the fifth in, in our series. Uh, we have um, uploaded everything onto our YouTube channel. I should just mention that next week, uh, our session with Susanna Kova is going to be slightly out of sync because Susanna is based in Australia. Um, this will be uh, taking place at 7 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time, uh, that is to say uh, 4 p.m. Western Standard Time, and uh, uh, 7 a.m. in uh, in the morning in, in, in China. Um, now, um, that will mean that it's be very difficult for those in Europe but, uh, to watch, but we will, of course, put the recording up there. And finally, at the end, we have our series, a session on Manfredo Tafuri um, with uh, Luisa Lorenzo Corner and Pippo Chiora, probably taking different views on whether or not architects can, can learn from philosophy. Um, but today, for sure, I think it's fair to say that uh, in the context of um, Donna Harrow, we certainly can. Um, so let's um, just, just be briefly mention, this is where we are uploading everything. On the bottom here is the, the YouTube uh, link for Digital Futures, um, and, and please subscribe and follow. Uh, I've also put in the Digital Futures uh, International website, and. I've included the Instagram account for myself and Digital Futures World, where we post everything that's coming up. So it's all available to, uh, and it's uh, um, and all for free. So please um, spread the word. So Donna Haraway is um, uh, uh, is is somebody now who's who's I think whose legacy. Um, she was very much one of the early pioneers in in in, in the field, um, especially of cyborg studies, and her her legacy I think is really coming to the fore these days. Um, uh, she's an American scholar. Um, she uh, was uh, um, teaching at the uh, at, at the History of Consciousness uh, course in the Feminism Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I should say at one point, the History of Consciousness uh, a master's uh, postgraduate program was one of the leading ones in the world. Freddie Jameson was also part of it, and uh, it was a, 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 a huge sort of center. Um, anyway, Donna, Donna is now retired. She's a professor emerita. Um, and uh, she's known primarily for sort of two areas, that is to say, uh, feminist studies, and I think she was the first tenure, tenure appointment in feminist studies, and also the world of cyborg studies. Um, uh, Heidi is, uh, we are delighted to have uh, Heidi Sohn and Robert Gorney here today uh, to, to, to join us. Uh, both of them are authorities on Donna Haraway. Uh, Heidi is an associate professor at the Architectural Theory Department at uh, Theo Delft in Holland, in the Netherlands. And Robert Gorney is a lecturer and soon to be an associate professor, assistant professor uh, in architecture, philosophy and theory at Theo Delft. And of course, last week we had the most astonishing session uh, from, also from Delft. So Delft is turning into quite, quite a, a center for, for research in this particular field. So what I want to do, and I'm, I don't want to kind of presuppose anything that Heidi and Robert are going to be talking about themselves, um, but I'm going to just offer a, br a brief outline about uh, Donna Haraway and her position within a broader field of what we could perhaps call cyborg studies. In Digital Futures a few years ago, we had a, our summer festival was based on the theme of cyborg futures, and it's something that we had um, that, that was, 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 was a central theme, and it continued the following year when we had Andy Clark as our keynote speaker. So I want to just kind of maybe sketch out a framework within which one can begin to sort of see uh, the work of, of Donna Haraway, um, uh, not necessarily focusing on, on her herself, because I'll leave that to, to, um, to Robert and Heidi, but just to say that, you know, 
she is the one person who really started talking about the cyborg. The cyborg was had been invented as a concept by NASA a few years before, but it started talking about the the, the concept of the cyborg in a way that is ahead of of anyone else, in a way that now has become in some way standard in some sense. And just to quote this, a few things. Um, uh, a cyborg is a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, a, a creature of social reality, as well as a creature of fiction. By the late 20th century, our time, a mythic time, we are all chimeras, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism. In short, we are all cyborgs. Why should our bodies end at the skin and or include at best other beings encapsulated by skin? So she set it out of what in her cyborg manifesto, you know, a really kind of provo provo provocative thing, uh, 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 agenda, which has been taken up by other people. I want today to kind of try and give a um, give a give a sense of a, a kind of a timeline, as it were, or, or a, um, a, 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 a a genealogy, shall we say, of thinking, of, especially on the notion of the tool and the tool as some kind of prosthesis, um, going from the work of Martin Heidegger through uh, to to the work of Andy Clark. So Heidegger, of course, Martin Heidegger is is, is famous as, as a for raising the issue of the tool um, in um, being in, in time. And, and uh, Graham Harmon, who's currently teaching at SIARC in, in Los Angeles, um, undertook his PhD on Heidegger and and and, it, and tool tool thinking. Um, and his, this book on the right, tool being, is essentially his his doctoral thesis. And what you get here is basically one particular thesis. Um, and I guess the, the, the crucial terms that really Heidegger talks about, or the crucial distinction that he, um, uh, 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 that he has is, is between these two concepts, which uh, whether a tool is there and you're using it the whole time, or whether a tool is something um, which you're not familiar with, and therefore it makes little sense to you, and therefore it's not really part of your repertoire. Those tools that you are familiar with become almost in some sense part of yourself. But the crucial term I always think here is the term being, uh, as opposed to becoming, um, uh, as opposed to the kind of pr the process philosophy we were talking about uh, last week. Um, I think it's very much a part of a discourse of, of representation. And this perhaps is the main criticism people like Jonathan Hale has made of this, uh, of his work on tools, the idea that actually that it's it's a static thing, it's a black and white, a binary thing, and not a kind of process of a gradual adaptation, a proprioception of those tools. And maybe to, to think about that in more dynamic terms, in more kind of process-based philosophy think terms, we could think possibly of the work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who talks about how we, gradually appropriate these, these tools. They become an extension in the sense of ourselves. Um, and, and when we're talking about a cyborg, we don't necessarily need to mean somebody who is kind of like a, a, a creature out of Star Wars or something. A simple walking stick will make us uh, a cyborg. A, a pen or a pair of glasses would also make us a, a, a pair of glasses, a pair, would make us a cyborg. And the way in which, for example, a blind person can navigate the street using a stick becomes a kind of almost like a, a, a prosthesis of, of his, his his perception points towards the way in which these tools can be absorbed within the body schema and become part of how we navigate the world. So in a sense, we navigate the world through these tools and we'll even perhaps extend that to say that when we're driving, we're driving as it were through the car. And that dynamic notion of appropriation of the tool of absorbing it within our body schema um, is an important one. Alongside that, we mentioned J.J. Gibson, James Gibson, yes, uh, last week, um, who I think is, in fact, the week before as well, with the question of Bruno Latour, who is also, in terms of his thinking about tool, I think a, a very, a very has a very important contribution, um, especially using the, the, the concept of affordance, what, what, how you can work with the affordance of a tool and, and get to know the tool through that kind of logic. And I would want to emphasize how useful I would say that Gibson's work is in that regard. But the crucial, in some ways, the crucial step had happened um, with an article that was published in the mid nineties um, by Andy Clark and David Chalmers. Andy Clark is a philosopher, a philosopher of consciousness. He's appeared before on Digital Futures uh, in our series, AI, neuroscience, and architecture, and 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 uh, that's David Chalmers on the left-hand side. Andy Clark is, uh, I guess you call him a cognitive scientist. He's uh, he's a, a cognitive philosopher in some senses. I once asked him what he how he'd like to be known. He said, "I'd be flattered if I were, could be called a neuroscience a ne neuroscientist." And he those two together uh, wrote an essay um, uh, that came out the extended mind that really was um, had a 
had a huge impact um, uh, on, on these kind of studies. Uh, the, question, the crucial question they're asking is where does the mind stop and the rest of the world begin? And in, in this, this article, they talk about uh, uh, two, two individuals um, who are going to meet at a, 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 an art gallery in New York. And one of them simply follows, goes the way that she knows because you know, she's just following her memory. The other guy, but the guy is who was suffering from Alzheimer's um, uh, has to make some notes and follows those notes in, in, in finding his way to, to the museum. And the point being essentially that these notes, like indeed the cell phone today, become a kind of prosthesis of our, 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 our awareness. They become part of how we operate. They become part of our extended mind. Um, Andy Clark then took that even further. And, uh, and, and I think it was in 2006, and I, I forget exactly, um, he published A Natural Born Cyborgs, um, Minds, Technologies, and the Future of Human Intelligence, um, which really, even though it's uh, uh, a little bit dated in some of its material, is, is very, very relevant and, and a very accessible um, book to read. And of course, by the time the book came out, we have things like uh, cell phones and things that really do become an extension of our, of our mind. And to the point that certainly whenever I'm, I can't find my cell phone or it's broken or something, I feel almost incapable in some senses. Just one brief comment about the cover of that book. Andy was never very happy with this um, this kind of science fiction cyborg creature on the front. He was his view is simply anything, as I mentioned before, anything makes us a cyborg, such as a pen, a pair of glasses, or a, a walking stick. Now, alongside that, there've been other debates that have been going on. Um, uh, Catherine Hales um, talks about how we've now become post-human. And this is something that maybe Andy Clark would would challenge in some senses. In a sense, what Andy's art trying to argue in his in his book *Natural Born Cyborgs*, it is precisely the plasticity of the human brain that allows us to adapt to and to be part of and to absorb these tools as part of how we operate. Um, in other words, it's not we're post-human; it's the fact that we are pre precisely human that we become, as it were, um, uh, that we have still remained the center of things. Um, the term post-human, of course, can be taken other sort of ways, but Andy Clark would say that actually that he, he disagrees with Kathleen Hales and points towards how it's precisely the plasticity of the mind itself that is that has made that makes us so easily uh, so capable of adapting to these tools. And now, of course, <clears throat> what's so interesting about this is that this whole notion of this uh, of, of this prosthesis of, of the cyborg and so on becomes hugely relevant with, with artificial intelligence these days. The discussion is not so much about uh, humans versus artificial intelligence, but humans with the AI, AI versus humans without AI. In other words, uh, humans can be augmented um, by the use of, of, of an AI, especially when you're using a simple cell phone that is having access to, to GPUs via the cloud and so on. It becomes literally a prosthesis as to how we, we, we operate. And the term often used instead of saying artificial intelligence is extended intelligence or uh, intelligence augmentation, a number of concepts. That's certainly for the moment how we operate with these as a, as a kind of a, 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 a augmentation of our bodies. And we can possibly also think about how other tools are used certainly in, in, in the design and construction practice tools like uh, augmented uh, reality tools um, that allow us to construct um, um, uh, buildings uh, uh, through phologram and so on. So there are a whole range of different sort of tools and indeed maybe tools that can allow us to lift up uh, heavier weights and so on, that now become part of this so that it also augment and it's not just simply, uh, it's not just simply the AI or indeed the cell phone itself. And this is a comment just to finish off um, uh, from uh, Elon Musk. All of us already are cyborgs. You have a machine extension of yourself in the form of your phone and your computer and all your applications. You are already superhuman. This is, in a sense, act uh, 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 um, building upon the comments of Donna Harry herself, where we are each year's commenting, we are all already cyborgs. Um, so I'm going to uh, leave it uh, at that and uh, hand over to um, to, uh, uh, to to Robert and Heidi. Um, Welcome, it's great to have you here today, especially following on from that terrific session uh, with Stavros and An Andre last week. It's, uh, it's, it's, I'm kind of envious of the situation you have in, um, in Delft. It's really become a powerhouse of theory, which is, which is remarkable. It's uh, very encouraging to see, so welcome. 
Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon here from a very sunny, uh, sunny day, finally here in Amsterdam from my living uh, room, actually from my dining table, I say hello. Also to everybody else in other time zones and other places around the planet. I want to thank you, uh, Neil, so much for your lovely introduction and also for the great opportunity to, uh, to share this, um, this space and this moment with your audience. I think the, the initiative is a, is a really, really uh, interesting project and uh, as needless to say, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, so taking advantage of this uh, of this moment where I can actually speak to your to your audience, I am going to take advantage of this and make a small unrelated announcement. Um, I'm going to share my slides now. Hopefully uh, you can all, the, all see them. Um, let me know if you can the screen. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, this is uh, this is an announcement and an invitation for everyone who's uh, interested. Perhaps in November of last year, we held a symposium uh, with the title "Noetics Without a Mind: Affordances, Technicities, Pedagogies." So uh, I'm very glad uh, and, and thankful for your introduction, Neil. Um, and we had a really nice lineup of speakers and thinkers who came and shared their ideas and their uh, and their thoughts with us. So we had the really nice and very productive uh, afternoon uh, with all these uh, these invitations and so on. So uh, we decided to to uh, make this project a, a book project. Now we're uh, inviting everyone to uh, who is interested to submit a contribution for this book project uh, and um, that Robert, Andre, Stavros, and I will co-edit. And uh, we're uh, thinking to having this book ready by uh, the spring of 2024. So we invite everyone uh, to uh, contribute with uh, with ideas and with uh, with the paper submissions. Um, if you are interested in in uh, ideas of social, technical, and environmental dimensions of noesis of thinking through transdisciplinary approaches, so um, if you're dealing with these questions or you know anyone who might be interested, or if you are uh, if you are aware uh, and uh, interested also in answering Gregory Bateson's question on how we can sense differently in order to think differently, then uh, this is a book project that uh, you should uh, certainly give a try. The deadline is approaching. We have marked uh, the 15th of, uh, of April for a deadline, but the submission is not a very extensive one. We're looking for short uh, thought pieces, academic thought pieces from uh, all corners of, uh, of academia. So you're invited to participate. There are, um, uh, you can uh, send us an email to the email address that is on the screen and uh, also uh, punch it in your in your search engine and uh, you will find more information about the call. So after this shameless uh, uh, announcement and invitation, I will start then with my with my presentation. Uh, I'm super excited uh, to to address the work of uh, one of my favorite scholars of all times, the larger than life, uh, Donna J. Haraway. It's especially nice to do this next to my dear colleague and my friend, uh, Robert Gorney, who is joining from Rotterdam, and uh, who will share his insights also uh, right after my, uh, my presentation. We will then follow uh, Neil's instructions, but uh, we hope we can have a little time to have clarification questions and hopefully also to uh, inaugurate a very lively Sunday discussion on a few of the myriad ways that Donna Haraway has influenced the world, uh, also that of architecture and beyond. So after last Sunday's magnificent intervention on the work of Henri Bergson by the Radman Kusulas duo, which it needs to be said, followed a chain of very interesting and advanced sessions on the preceding Sundays, the stakes are really high and the pressure is on. I mean, jokingly, uh, Robert and I were uh, touching base once in a while last week to see how bad our, our uh, anxiety attacks were getting, but uh, well, that was just jokingly. But uh, anyway, uh, at this stage, I do want to get something off my chest, just to make sure that there are no misunderstandings. I do not consider myself to be an expert in Donna Haraway's uh, work, not even close. I am, however, a fervent follower, an enthusiast, an aficionada in her writing, her thinking, and in her intellectual and public persona. I love the vibrancy of her thought and admire the everlasting, continuous commitment she has kept with all the amazing conceptual critters that she has created in her work. So I consider her a source of inspiration and a sorceress, a dexterous weaver of words and worlds, an energetic world smith. I find refuge in her many material discursive shelters, as well as in her continuous invitation to do things differently, to live otherwise otherworldly. Her demands for an ethics of care and responsibility, 
force us to stay and to remain accountable. Haraway has taught me to appreciate life as that window of vulnerability in playful, affirmative, and relational ways. This encompasses the will to enter, to meet, to mingle, to entangle, to engage in symbiosis, the nightmare of all essentialisms, but also the nightmare of psychology. To be prepared and ready to move beyond, forward, armed with a big bag of seeds under our arms or a fistful of compost. But most of all, I'm always so inspired by the joy of her ideas and to share with her the more mundi, the love for the world, the wonder of being alive, of being on, but also of being off this planet. In this moment in its history, or should I better say in her story, when the conditions seem to be ripe for the creation of a fascinating range of new post-human and hopefully also post-anthropocentric subjectivities and trajectories. So I have nothing but praise uh, and uh, for the fabulous and brilliant Donna Haraway. So I joined the ranks of her uncountable fans and admirers taking for granted that an elaborate bio introduction and an extensive list of her bibliographical achievements are not uh, required here today. What I will do, however, is to ponder a little bit on the Haraway philosophy theory architecture lineup and think how to best approach the question of what philosophy can teach architecture, or rather what architecture can learn from philosophy through Donna's work. This is a very tough uh, challenge, firstly, because Haraway, as you already know, while very much engaged with artistic practices and uh, many other forms of cultural expression and their production, has never really shown any specific interest in architecture, unlike other feminist philosophers, such as the Australian Elizabeth Gross, who has dedicated some thoughts to the matter. In fact, she has published uh, several books on the, on, the, on the topic. This aside, there are other complications, especially when trying to somehow categorize her tremendously rich work under a predetermined stream of contemporary philosophy. And of course, with all the impact that she has had on other, uh, on other uh, uh, scholars. From evolutionary biology, the life sciences, SCS, technoscience, primatology, critical theory, cultural theory, cultural analysis, cyber culture, queer theory, material feminisms, issues of gender and sexuality, and a seemingly unending list of domains and fields of study, Haraway is, to my mind, unique feminist philosopher of science and the epitome of the 21st century transdisciplinary scholar. Not a disciplinary specialist, but a thinker who roams across and beyond all imaginable domains of knowledge. Hers is a cosmonautic scholarship brought to the extreme in the broadest sense of the word. It brings the excitement and inspiration that traditional science and technology conventionally lack through creative ways of weaving worlds and words together into fantastic, fictional, fabulous, feminist arguments and rich entanglements that seem to be willing to go everywhere, like Maya Celia or ants. When I think of her work, I often imagine it as being embroidered or inscribed in the Milky Way, set against the dark night sky with its twinkling constellations in continuous movement. When I read her work, I instinctively want to reach for a telescope or wish I had a powerful microscope at hand. Her writing is copic and specular. Donna Haraway has surrounded herself with a theory of incredible richness, conformed by her companion species and the kin that she has helped to birth. Multilect, critters, dragons, creatures, cells, monsters, embryos, primates, women, viruses, cyborgs, sheep, dog, mutant lab mice, symbionts, coyotes, compost, octopi, medusas, and many other beautiful organisms and phenomena who will be transiting in our slides today. These are much more than simple discrete objects located within given time-space coordinates, and much more than surrogate metaphors that carry meaning and stand in correspondence for something else. Her metaphors do things. They perform specific acts like characters in a continuously self-writing plot. In her essay, Virtual Speculum, which is also included in the chapter, A Modest Witness, originally published partially with Thursa Nichols' uh, Good Eve in 1997, she highlights how, and I quote her, figurations are performative images that can be inhabited. Verbal or visual figurations are condensed maps of whole worlds, end of quote. Like herself, these speculative fictions co-create intricate string figures and perform other agile narrative moves. They are like coyotes, they are tricksters, and I quote her again, that may turn a stack deck into a potent set of wild cards for refiguring possible worlds, end of quote. I will turn to the notions of speculation and how her figurations may populate 
these possible worlds further on. But for now, let's agree that they have aided Haraway to identify, grasp, and tackle extremely complex issues that are of great ethical, onto, and epistemological import today. Haraway's life work has been a crusade against thoughtlessness, as she says, against some of the most ingrained ideological structures and persistent systems of control, domination, and exclusion in our contemporary structures and worlds. It takes a modern Joan of Arc to lead this vibrant legion, or rather confederation of allies, to carry out these delicate yet vital tactics. As in every confederation, communication, conversation, understanding are key, especially if these occur among members of different species. Haraway relies on her figurations to function as heuristic devices and tools to code, decode and recode the many interrelated entangled phenomena that shape the world. She, leads, she learns how to read and interpret their systems, their language, the signs of their niches and habitats, their desires. This helps her to figure out what counts as reality. Haraway's understanding of reality is connected to worlding and to inhabitation. It is deeply relational and as such, it's environmental. Reality is a matter of relationality, she says, and I quote her. It's a matter of testing the holdingness of things. Do things hold or not? What is it that hangs together? End of quote. In figuration and narrative, we are all co-implicated in relation, and thus we are all witnesses of the myriad of life systems, how they operate, and what it is that makes them hold together. But we're also co-creators. We are, in her words, world-making machines, end of quote. This relational and deeply systemic outlook, which uh, Bobby is going to actually deal with in his talk, I believe, allows Haraway to move back and forth between disciplinary and discursive fields. For instance, her work with her colleague and compatriot, the evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis, who is the lesser known ideator of the Gaia theory with James Lovelock and also a fantastic thinker. She deals with symbiosis, symbogenesis, and of course, symbiosis but she expresses this in a narrative that is closer to literature and prose than it is to the language used in any article published in a high impact peer reviewed science journal. This permits Donna to potentialize the effective charge of words such as mixotrija paradoxa as meaning and give them signification. Or as she would probably prefer to say, as generative seeds from where shapes and things and phenomena and relations will surely emerge. These critters promising monsters, hybrid characters, models, but also subjectivities. Why I get so energized and even excited by them is because they are multitaskers. On the one hand, they establish and sustain these incredibly productive and vital relations, while simultaneously exposing, questioning, and overturning trusted positions, metrics, methods, and dominant geometries of power. So the concerns and critique that run throughout Donna's work are indeed the core problem of Western thought models, namely toxic binarisms and other bifurcations, the limitation, the drawing of boundaries, and the establishment of epistemological and disciplinary borders at the service of a civilizational project founded on the premise of classification and, ta and taxonomic reasoning. We know all by now, partly thanks to the insistence of the work of feminist scholars like Donna Haraway, that this premise or logic lays buried under a culprit of most, if not many, of our contemporary troubles. The denunciation of this gridding model as conducive to exploitation, alienation, exclusion, and many other toxic mechanisms sits at the core of a counter project to not only expose this model as unjust or unethical, but in some of her writing appears as denunciation, but also as critique to thoughtful, thoughtlessness that sits right next to irresponsibility. In her terms, this would be the inability to respond, to be mute, silent, complicit, but also unable to think and therefore to care with others. However, Haraway's work, as I see it, is not exclusively about denunciation or critique against the dominant model. In her quest for discovery, something that I think is inherent in all explorers, adventurers, scientists, inventors, she identifies frames and sets out to suspend and ultimately solve the, them to investigate them, their limits and their perimeters as well as their contents. This leaves the inside and the outside of a system bare to sight. The methods utilized are many, among them diffraction, interference, and distortion. 
These are, it needs to be said here, phenomena in optics and physics, and coincidentally also in architecture. On the other hand, the inside-out problem or relation is not only a, a spatial, physical, or visual mechanism, it is also a temporal one, an operation that architecture understands almost implicitly. But before I go further into this detour and encounter some other wormholes along the way, let me return to my flow and refocus on Haraway's truly transdisciplinary work and her transversal mode of thinking making. As a true pantopian, a word that I borrow from another true pantopian, the fabulous thinker Michel Serre, Haraway weaves all sorts of semiotic material into intricate textures that are always historically specific, grounded in contingency, and almost per definition unclassifiable. Her work is not theory, but it's also not philosophy, strictly speaking. It might be none, it might be both. Like Haraway, I do think that philosophy must not be reduced to a specific mode, but especially not to reflection and contemplation alone. Theory should not be confused with generalization, equated with abstraction, or cornered away as universalization, but instead, it must be process-oriented, relational, and non-teleological, that is, not aimed or directed towards an end goal, product, or result. Haraway herself considers that what she does is not the production of philosophy or theory per se, but their actual practice. I understand this as more, more than just uh, uh, pragmatism. I think it is performative agential realism, a form of speculation. She does theory, always through concrete worldly examples that involve a parliament or rather a confederation of multiple others. This is arguably more than an elaborate pedagogy or simple didactics. It is a philosophy of life for life, for thinking through things, for knowing and making and learning and teaching otherwise, for staying with the matters that concern us. It's an existential philosophy of sorts, a matter of life and death. These concepts are central in Haraway's work, and they resonate quite nicely in architecture too, especially when we align them to the view that confirms no primacy to either architecture theory nor to the design practice, but instead sees them as co-constitutive and relate activities in a generative process of collaborating, a collaboration, collaborative thinking making. This is, I argue, how habits are shaped and in our architectural lingo, how the built and lived and experience, experienced environments are materialized and effectively activated as habitats. Haraway's approach allows us to understand learning as an important component of worlding, as something that happens in the world, attending to our being in relation not only with human others, but with the world itself and with many other more than human companion species and other inhuman agents and forces. Learning is an enactment, or as she refers to it, a corporeal cognitive practice. That is a creative encounter of relational acts of thinking and doing, or what would amount to the entanglement of matter and meaning. We learn through specific earthly, often mundane embodied acts of communion and communication, also referred to as modes of life and existence, or as conversations in some parts of our work with human and more than human others, and thus learn to articulate and to connect differences through desires, not through similarities. Much of this could be and is applied in architectural discourse and theory production, also known in some circles as architecture thinking, as well as a more liberal understanding of architecture as an ever expanding field of operations enmeshed in an ecology of practices, to borrow Isabel Stenger's by now very well-known notion. More to the point though, the overlap exists at the level of understanding that sees architecture as a material discursive practice, as a worlding dynamic. My colleague Stavros referred to it last week as well, architecture as an act and as a process, the process of architecting. So while it is true that Haraway who by the way has always been interested in the genesis of forms in nature via embryology or evolutionary biology, for instance, but has never shown any explicit interest in architectural morphogenesis, her philosophy and a lot of her theoretical work have had and continue to have deep impact on the way that architecture learns, how it sees itself and how it acts in the world. Together with other critical feminists of science, Haraway's work and thinking steers architecture to unlearn many of the unhealthy habits, methods, and techniques that it has inherited from the applied sciences, in particular from engineering and several of the design traditions and logics, but instead begin to understand itself as a worlding practice, that is, to participate in the purposeful transformation of the world, as my colleague Bob often tells me. 
This entails the ability to not only determine the conditions of a context as a physical site through analytical methods, but to effectively recognize and discern the environmental signs and information upon which such transformation and changes may take flight and become possible. And here we might start seeing the long-term influence of Haraway's pedigree on architecture. From the ethical political positionality of when, where, how, why, and especially who is generating the situated readings and observations, and the politics obviously of location, but also of difference involved in them, the interpretation hermeneutics of the material A signifying, but also the semiotic conditions and the reconfigurations to the potential and effective import of the imagining, sensing, and speculating, not only as high-tech operations assisted by all sorts of prosthetics, sensing and speculating, not only as high-tech operations of uh, gadgets, but also in Haraway's terms, a speculative fabulation or SF. In other words, as methods and instruments to harness fundamental, radical, and lasting change over time in a plurality of interconnected, interdependent, but also often incommensurable physical and incorporeal environs, milieus, and worlds. Ultimately, all these worlds, regardless of their constitution, are grounded and situated on this planet in this moment. So in this crux of where I want to go today, and I hope I will manage. So to understand Haraway a bit more globally, it is a good idea to lay out a sort of surface cartography with some tracing indications of the genealogies that her work aligns with, and especially the many and varied trajectories that her work has sparked over the last four or five decades. Donna Haraway is quite of an icon in the theoretical landscapes that shaped, that shaped the turn of the, the third millennium, a climate of paradigmatic shifts, techno-scientific revolutions, epistemological turns, and discursive wars. What a turmoil, what a turbulence. Without her work, the feminist waves would have been other. And we can say without a doubt that her contributions have given sustenance to a strong line of radical critical feminist theory of science and technology around which other important feminist epistemologies and materialisms uh, take place. I cannot not mention the importance that these feminisms have had and continue having on the political and ethical domains of the social sciences, cultural theories and analysis, but also on human geography, architecture and other spatial disciplines. And obviously on the impact that all these have on the arts more globally and the artistic practices more specifically. So instead uh, of trying to do justice uh, to all these connections uh, to the wonderful genealogies in one breath, I better add these uh, two beautifully produced cartographies that render momentarily the genealogies that Haraway pertains to or belongs to. So I give uh, credit and profuse thanks to Robert who so kindly shared these links uh, and his own work with me. I am aware of the difficulties of properly reading and seeing these maps on the screen. So if anyone is interested, um, I have added the, the links to, to their sources at the bottom of the slide. This in particular is a, a very recent one by Bryony uh, Roberts and uh, Brianna Aelken from uh, EFLUX. From these amazing genealogical cartographies, which Haraway is situated in, I want to single out a few keywords. Visualization, vision, perspectivism, and the specular, the cyborg, the god trick of lab caught men, material semantic nodes and knots in which these figures and figurations are entangled, the problem of binarisms and boundary dissolutions. All these are expressions and searches of feminist embodiments of cartographic ex experiments, as well as mapping practices, such as the ones that you see on your screens. And finally, the indispensability and vital importance of notions of care in the conversations that we hold with companion species and other inhuman, non-human, more than human, other than human counterparts. If I had more time, I would uh, probably refer to Jane uh, Bennett's uh, uh, flat ontology, which in my mind is uh, anything but flat, and mention her work on uh, vibrant matters. But out, out of all these uh, and so many other possibilities to enter Haraway's uh, universe, I have picked only four. So I will start with the, the famous, um, I will start like so many other accounts that start with, the, with, the, with Haraway's work with the mythic and wonderful figure of the cyborg, who has achieved somewhat of a celebrity status since its appearance back in 1985. Carrie Wolf refers to this as a phenomenon, as an icon, and I totally agree with him on that point um, and many other points as well. Donna Haraway's cyborg, 
a pioneer figuration that is imported from cybernetics especially, but also from cultural studies and science fiction cinema and literature, is not an android, it's not a robot or an automaton, but instead a sophisticated creation that extends and threatens the boundaries of what it means to be human. That's why it is so powerful and that's why it is so attractive. It pushes us to think about us, about ourselves, but also and especially about the world that we have created. It is, as Matthew Gandhi argues, an ontological strategy to extend human knowledge and describe phenomena that are somehow outside conventional frameworks of understanding and cognition. It also articulates theoretical positions to explore the interface between technology and the body, a theme that was invoked during the 1980s and 1990s, which is having a comeback, as Neil, uh, as Neil mentioned in the introduction. Thus, Haraway Cyborg is perhaps the best current example for a related underlying idea that is key to understand her noted, nodal work, namely the problem of historical contingency and context in relation to what is constitutive of reality on the one hand, and on the other, of what is epistemologically uh, important, namely something that helps us to discover something about ourselves or the world which we didn't know, something that will change us fundamentally. It is also something constitutive, that which has the potential to disrupt historical and other contexts, destabilize ideologies and belief systems, as well as to force us to question established or existing paradigms. In short, the constitutive is something that triggers relations that conduce to the expression of difference. In tandem, through mutual constitution, some, these, some of these relations are capable of triggering change. And change here is understood as much more than just veering, a slight change in direction, but really the eruption of the new, of the unexpected, of innovation, if you like. And here, techno-scientific entanglements with organic and inorganic matter, in fact, are central. The entanglement of visualization instruments and technologies, organisms, parts of organisms, disciplinary methods, scientific laws, theories, discourse, lab material, and embedded human agents engage in relational and systemic exchanges and dances at the edge of the world. These, these dances are always have an effect. They are co-constitutive of new situations. Thus, and to simplify a quite complicated and complex operation that involves a critique of constructivism and productionism at the level of modern science, the entanglement of asignifying material and semiotic material in the cyborg nevertheless affords, sustains, and allows creative and thus generative acts. Please note that the emphasis here is on the act or the process and not on the end product uh, outcome or result of prototype. So we can probably speak of creation in the raw rather than to ponder on how production and reproduction work and what they produce and what they don't produce. Then to return to Haraway Cyborg, we encounter a sort of a paradox. On the, on the one hand, the cyborg is a historical agent set in a particular historical context, the techno-militarized 1980s USA, with all its toxic works and nasty particularities. The cyborg embodies these characteristics and is embedded in that particular context. However, and perhaps more visibly in hindsight, Donna Cyborg, in her fleshy yet technological embodiment, effectively denounces, exposes, suspends, and ultimately dissolves a series of persistent binaries and, and their stubbornly slashed boundaries. Nature, culture, organic, inorganic, man, machine, human, non-human, mind, body, etc. It is through the cyborg that Haraway breaks open deeply encroached models, the word model we will return later, but also structures and the, the mythologies around which they are produced from patriarchy to the artificiality of nature and its domination. Several of these structures had remained effectively invisible for centuries. Hence the cyborg and the entanglement that it participates in reveals how vision and sight are component technologies, or we could even say te com companion technologies of these structures, how they are constructed, hence giving information on how they function or work. In other words, this goes beyond the matrix and affor affords actual ownership of their program, but also of where and how they are positioned and obviously of who is deploying them. So the cyborg suddenly reveals how apparently or seemingly neutral, actually instrumental, specular techniques and technologies and their apparatuses are far from innocent and obviously much more than contextual. They are exposed as key techno-scientific components or agents, 
We need a military complex that does so much more than simple control and surveillance. As the cyber denounces, it constructs subjects and objects, including those disturbing visions of a prosthetically augmented human. Needless to say, here we are already at the confines of conventional humanism. A transhuman figure lurks on the horizon or is in fact already creeping out from under our own very own skin. Haraway Cyborg, on the other hand, brings to the fore the so-called promise of monsters, which he embodies in this incredibly aesthetic image by, by the artist Lynn Randolph that has become popularized as the first post-human. She, the cyborg, is among the more complex of Haraway's figurations. This agile trickster who reveals in her map intensive cartographic information or specular visualization technologies from microscopes, telescopes, and other optical instruments, interfaces, drones, cameras, computers, and so on, as well as other possible techniques, the specular, refraction, uh, diffraction, interference, distortion, speculation, and even abduction. Hence, the cyborg sits at her computer at her computer keyboard in tactile contact with the earth as a contextual historical contingent agent displaying the ontic on her desk of deserts, mountains, and glaciers, but also, and very importantly so, whispering a forward a very loud what if, a sound bite that touches us and carries us into the beyond. And it is that beyond where Donna Haraway rules. She is the philosopher of the beyond of the speculative Fs, which I would dare include a future. She knew this back in 1998, 19, 1985, sorry. I will now move to the next knot, namely the knot of the God trick implied in her very famous notion of situated knowledges. An important component of Donna's work, one that resonates loudly in the architectural discipline is a critique of modern Western science as an epistemology, as a fabrication, as a refined myth, and also as that, as that way to, to explain and justify disembodiment. It is a corner of her work that would merit the whole research seminar series and would almost necessarily include the intermission of several of the key philosophers and scholars of the late 20th century and the early 21st. In a nutshell, however, Haraway, like many others, claims that modern Western science, and I want, will also bundle dominant knowledge regimes in, uh, here in, in uh, two for one, are suspect, as I mentioned uh, already, on the count of making claims to truth via objectivity. These claims are disseminated by a curated power maneuvers and sophisticated mechanisms of omission, occlusion, and elimination. Haraway refers to them as God tricks and points at the white-coated lab scientist as their silent or modest witness, which by the way, is also a pilot of incredibly strong and potent instruments and technologies. In reality, this is a problem of epistemological trust, of course, but also and especially a problem of perspective of where, when, why, and especially who makes these truth claims, knowledge claims, power claims, in the name of scientific objectivity and neutrality. In other words, passing on things as fluid truths or givens from nowhere. Thus, it is a view or a knowledge that claims to be universal. Further, and almost in one sweep, she charges against relativism, denouncing its holistic, pluralistic claims as unrooted, or rather as all over the place or everywhere without specificity of situation, views, knowledge and truth become indiscernible and thus irrelevant. The cacophony of voices coming from everywhere, everything, everywhere, everyone all at once, while it makes a really cool uh, film title, renders it difficult, if not impossible, to discern what holds and what doesn't. In other words, what counts as objectively reasonable and possible conditions of reality? The threat of uh, a false truth rooted in objectivism, the dislocated view of the all-knowing one from nowhere, and its hyperstatic counterpart, the view of the many from everywhere, is precisely the omission and subsequent erasure of history, or rather of her stories, and the lives and existence of countless others, past, present, and future, including other modes of knowing and being in the world. The exclusion and extermination of other modes of existence and forms of knowledge, and here we would have to uh, mentioned the systematic rejection and annihilation also of extant and surviving native, germane, and indigenous knowledges that are specific and thus expert to a particular locale, so really knowledge and not some exotic expression of culture, call into question the underlying motivation for these sorts of truth claims and power grabs as epitomes of colonial imperial impulses, but also 
of other kind of uh, reactions such as the post-colonial and the post-colonial. So the God trick is, I think, something that architects almost intuitively understand and recognize as part and parcel of a tradition that we have inherited from the engineering domain. Haraway's God trick is a concept that conveys an intangible yet unassailable authority, a sort of geniality that comes with narrative rights. In contemporary architecture, this voice is all too familiar. In the recent past, this voice was embodied in the figure of the white male genius architect, so talented his knowledge and authority were uncontested and remained undisputed. Much of modernist architecture and urban design and hence much of our built environment is the result of such a position. Today, however, this monovision, which is still disguised as coming from nowhere or worse, coming from an entity pretending to be pluralist and liberal facilitator of connections and participation is nonetheless that still that white male professional practitioner, usually a star architect or wannabe star, who now has lost his autonomy and is subservient to political and economic forces beyond his control, or so goes the myth. The significance of Haraway's notion of situated knowledges poses a problem of positionality and perspective of the observer, of course, as an ethical political problem of legitimation. But it is also the entry point to discuss and rethink through how the situatedness of a situation problematizes also the claims to reality, to a ground. As Haraway reminds us, situated knowledges do not claim place or even space as conventional physical categories of location. Instead, they force us to think about particular contexts the relationality between the global and the local, something which today we can extend even to planetary and cosmic uh, scales, I would say. It questions the strongholds, uh, uh, the strongholds like sight and sight as common places of worldviews and positions as both embodied and incorporeal and so on. These are situated knowledges that question center and decenter a position on the planet to extroverted views from outside, in this case, from outer space, like NASA will not uh, tire from showing us. The intimate views from inside, in this case, as Nielsen's fetus photographs from the 1960s and 70s. And the images of wormholes and black holes of the Earth that, it's, that the Earth itself can make today. I borrow Benjamin Bratton's elaboration of the recent uh, 2019 Event Horizon telescopic images of this black hole. I wish I had more time to go into this. Maybe uh, at the end of the discussions, we will find time to do so. The point of these images is not to illustrate any theory or any idea, Haraway or mine, but rather to briefly mention that what these images do is to show how our technologies of visualization are complicit in these regimes and reinforce the position of knowledge assumed by the human as an exceptional species inhabiting a constructed version of nature and of the environment, which by the way of these images also extends into space, thus claiming universality. None of it is contextual, it is constitutive, co-produced. The question begs, what if we learned how to integrate the situatedness of situations and practices and co-created a forward-looking attitude, a gesture, a touching device that would not rely on any of the dominant human-centered visualizing technologies, including the gaze, the glance, visions, perspective, a TikTok POV or point of view, to make a, a truth claim to reality, for this to be possible, we will have to be open to learn how to exist with our companion species. And one prerequisite would be to change gears and to slow down. So in that vein, recently I accompanied my 12 year old son to visit several secondary schools here in Amsterdam. So he had enough information to pick his favorite school for the next academic year. I know this sounds quite unrelated, but it's not. On a Saturday morning, a couple of weeks ago, we were introduced to a school system known as Tecnasium. It's a crossover of middle school uh, level STS uh, or beta courses as they're called in the Netherlands with a nice mix of course components fully reliant on the humanities, design and the arts. The students had displayed their schoolwork for the visiting kids to look at and to get an idea of what it was that they did in their schools. In general, the work was quite impressive, very hands-on with a lot of emphasis on experimentation and the materialization of research into tangible 3D objects. On one of the tables, however, I saw a cardboard model that represented what looked like a scaled down tree house. Next to it, there were some take home printouts describing the subject of the class, namely AOD or animal oriented design. 
The model was a project for a chimpanzee retreat that had been commissioned to this school by Artis, the Amsterdam Zoo. As an architect, I immediately looked at it and studied it in detail. I was happily surprised by the depth and care of the work. It was a project that effectively took the primates as their clients and users. And in the degree of a secondary school pupil, the research was really solid. I thought of uh, Donna Haraway right away, how this related to situated knowledges, of course, but mostly of how and what happens when species meet. I wanted to imagine, so how school children spending significant time with chimps would try to understand their needs, their habitats, their, their behaviors, their diets, and so on. They had to immerse in their environments and not only through mediated uh, information like B Wikipedia. So the conclusions of the reports were quite striking. The chimp retreat should have a series of functions and programs, but more importantly, the kids recommended the abolition of the logic that makes zoos, zoos possible in the first place. They demanded the ending of a system that allowed animals to be kept in captivity for our entertainment. Why I mentioned this apparently trivial example is because I think that in order to deconstruct and break down the ingrained beliefs about human exceptionalism, human children need to encounter other species in the flesh, not as food, not as pets, and certainly not as entertainment, but as true companions, as terrans, and learn how to converse with them. This is a crucial horizon event, which nonetheless will have an impact on, on the foreseeable future. For it to take place, it is necessary to dissolve a critical last boundary at the level of the individual organism. This is an essential step, and I understand how problematic this term is, in the breaking down of toxic speciesism and the last step towards the understanding of the irreducibility of what Felix Gattari referred to in his three ecologies, the psychic, collective, and environmental domains. When species meet, the entanglements become truly relevant. It, upon, it is upon these entanglements that life itself depends. There are, of course, and will always be, remainders and reminders of wounds of separation, laws, rights, normative and prescriptive rules of conviviality. There will probably be long negotiations of what counts as symbiosis and where to draw the parasitic lines. There will be many complex and often incommensurable attempts and approaches of world building and worlding dynamics which will continue to set off myths of creation and genesis based on legalities, jurisprudence, and governance. But the awareness of the importance of activating multi-species design thinking parallels the imperative of establishing and protecting contact zones where humans can meet their more than human peers. Possibilities for a slower and perhaps better beyond seem to be emerging, at least in some expected places like a middle school in Amsterdam. When species meet, Haraway's figuration reappear with a vengeance. The power of Zulu penetrates the membranes of reality, questioning, questioning its factuality embodied in an explosion of threatened but also threatening biodiversity composed of critters, paradoxa, viruses, earthly stringy beings. At the edges of extinction and in the curricula of some human middle schools, the exceptional status of man and its proxy Anthropos are being called into question. So after this not so short interlude, I continue with Haraway's key concepts, namely that of FF or speculative fabulations, speculative feminism, string figures, science fiction, so far. These SFs are not a fancy or a whim like monsters, metaphors, and other tropes in Haraway's work. They are an integral thread in the meaning, making, and signification. Paraphrasing Ursula Le Guin, a favorite kin of Donna Haraway, and I quote, worlds hold worlds. They mean things. They give support to a host of methodologies that she deploys in her writing, in which she crafty forms of narrative fabulation, a form of theory fiction that extends the power of the fantastic present, but hidden in the many fables and myths of science has been telling us into the realm of the real, where I believe they belong. The use of imagination, however, is not naive or even literal. It articulates speculative thought with a radical beyond that is never to be confused with the future as a verb tense. Haraway's speculative beyond is not some faraway destination, a scenario projected outwards, a distant temporality nested in some glossy or terrible futurity. Haraway's beyond is always already here, situated in the thickness of the present. These aspects of imagination and speculative fabulation are something that I think architecture could and should relate to, not as representationalism or the obsession with scenarios and prognosis of the future, 
but as latent potential, as a site of thinking, and as a necessary precondition for thought to emerge. So I return to Ursula Le Guin and her seedback uh, theories as a way to circumvent that which our culture has always assigned primacy, tools and instruments, uh, things to uh, make things with, weapons to hunt and kill, words not to construct other worlds with particularly, but to impose the one. Le Guin's seedback figure, which Haraway inherits, or rather adopts so lovingly in her work, becomes another artifact, a container, a bag, a receptacle. I can't help but feel immediately attracted to this image, and God help me, also identified, perhaps as an earthling, or as a woman, perhaps as a mother, but certainly as an architect. One of the primordial commitments we tacitly make as architects is to provide the conditions for shelter and refuge, for humans especially, but uh, also for many others. So while it might not be as I write it here, architecture contains worlds, perhaps we them to project them into possible futures. It creates visions, images, or scenarios of possible inhabitations of necessary indumenta and of some useful objects to carry with us. A leaf, a gourd, a shell, a net, a bag, a sling, a sack, a bottle, a pot, a box, a container, a holder, a recipient, a building. The environment is our affective niche. We shape it and, it and we are shaped by it in reciprocal affective relations. In such environments, seed and compost, humus rather than humans, are what we desire to move away from fantasies of autonomous beings and individuality to atomized and perhaps uh, even symbiotic uh, symbionts. Symbiosis or symbiosis as one of the outcomes of the meeting of species. In other words, what makes us queasy is the thought that when species merge, when hybrids rule, when the cyborg takes over, the individual self ends. Here, symbiosis seems to be the cue for the development of alternatives. And one such alternative is what I think is quite problematic, known as the symbiocene. This is, seems to be a new way of reinvigorating covert humanisms or even speciesisms. And therefore, we need to be careful not to reproduce and, and repeat the logics, methods, and tools that, go, uh, that got us here in the first place. So once we figure out how something works, once we own the program to, so, uh, to how something works, contradicting what we might believe, the system can and will end. A deeper understanding of symbiosis is required, one which brings us back to evolutionary biology. So what are these possible speculative fabulations beyond incredibly rich and almost tactile prose? How can this prose, this worlding, ground itself in this world? What are the technicities and modes to sense, imagine, and speculate beyond simple representational techniques of reflection and projection? How can, and perhaps more importantly, how do design practices and the spatial disciplines, including geography, urbanism, architecture, and landscape, keep and check the production of their representations from imaging, image, imagining, and visualization. How do these practices and disciplines mediate between sight and sight, between contextual and constitutive issues? So I finally managed to squeeze in some questions that might help us designers to practice more responsibly with attention to our ability to converse and to respond. This applies to all domains and scales of design, from its education to its practice. But this is not all, and it is not as simple as I am making it sound here. For design is always already much, much more than the reductive understanding of it as the practice of conceptualization and designing useful objects and the means for their fabrication. It involves the design of the problems and the solution to those problems, which are not always problems of design. They extend into other scales and problematic fields, often very well removed from the drafting table, or should I say the computer screen, where design often takes place. Design is involved also in the generation of structures, infrastructures, system of things, ideas, mentalities, thoughts, politics by design, civilization by design. In the same vein, the automatism to think that if, we, if the dire problems or wicked problems as they're called, that we face today are problems of and by design, then design can solve them, only perpetrates those same problems. Without the intention or the time space to go into design culture any more than this, I nonetheless would like to point out a shift that is being welcomed by some 
and that is taking place in the logics of contemporary design practices. From user-centered, usually human-centered conventional design, the typical 20th century modern humanist mentality that took man the modular as the model and metric even for the design of something as banal as a toilet is now cracking. And from its fragmentation, a wild gamut of non-conventional and seemingly non-human-centered design approaches and logics are emerging that perhaps contain some potential and untapped methods to design thinking or actually to speculate about design as a truly forward-looking practice. From transitional design, ontological design, speculative design to pluriversal design, and the myriad other mutations and nomenclatures that are appearing, what remains to be seen is whether these design logics will effectively be able to decenter and rethink their human subjects and reformulate their techniques and methods to adapt and contribute to a burgeoning human, post-human and hopefully also a post-anthropocentric and post-apocalyptic world. And being so close to wrapping up, I still have to dedicate a few words to that epoch, that era, that has caused so much upheaval of recent, the Anthropocene. Donna Haraway is, of course, no stranger to this era, the time of man. Her interventions on the topic have gained as much notoriety as her beautiful cyborg earned her more than 30 years ago. What bothers Haraway and many of us of the Anthropocene as an argument and as a discursive problem, and mind you, not the phenomena that it represents or reflects, is not just its persistence in the media and its very, frankly, very problematic crossing of scientific domains from stratigraphy to everywhere else, including the automatic adoption in every, everyday life. What seems to be the problem with the problem of the Anthropocene is not so much that it is an unimaginative dystopian scenario, it is that it is an end game. In its end game, vision meets horizon event and exterminates the possibilities of life, including perhaps the possibility of styling of dying or own death, like Donna Haraway calls it, a double death. Extinction is not becoming. If I retrieve what I mentioned earlier about how, when we figure out how something works, we consume it, we finish it or end it, so to speak, I can't think of a better example than the Anthropocene. We think we know how the earth systems work. We have become part of some of the forces of these energies and systems, daring to drill and extract and destroy as much as we like. We understand the human genome now and own the program for its DNA sequence. We also know how it will play out, how the end looks. We have recorded footage of floods, fires, earthquakes, just in case to stitch them together into narrative nightmares that are designed to make us feel unique, guilty, afraid, and on a disturbing level, also special. In the back of our minds, we also know that we are most likely alone in the cosmos and that other planets are up for grabs once our own planet gives in and goes under. The colonizing impetus is well in our life and expressed in transhuman projects of terraforming and other geoconstructivist engineering brought to a planetary and cosmic scales. The end is also desired by some of, the, of these horizon events um, theorists of capitalism, the capitalist does. The extractivist logics are accelerated until exhaustion is reached. Following ideas such as Levi Bryant's in ontocartographies, we can indeed state that when a system ends, another world becomes possible. Under this argument, there is one world, and although there is the possibility to destroy it and build it anew, it totally ignores the fact that there are actually many such worlds and realities operating simultaneously, right now, right here. These dark or deep ecological views are banking on ontological ideas that take for granted the actually existing impact and the very real consequences, both material and semiotic, of this type of narrative. The point here is that those two are narratives, as Benjamin Bratton's extensive and super solid work in the terraforming project shows. Another interesting reference to this discussion that I encountered recently is a translation of Frederic Neibet's The Un this Un Unconstructable Earth and Ecology of Separation of 2019. So Haraway reminds us that if we have been taking at face value everything science has told us so far, both truth and its myths, and that we are now understanding that we are indeed in charge of our own earthly narratives or geohistory, we then should be able to select a narrative that fosters responsible, careful, caring, and slower paced thoughts and action, always with others, human and more than human. This is Haraway's call for an alternative worlding against deadly geoconstructivist tendencies a terraforming on this earth with others. Her response is Terrapolis, 
an attempt to influence and change the working of systems via the introduction of a fictional integral equation, a speculative fabulation. In Saying with the Trouble, a very, very well read uh, book also by students, she writes, and I quote her, consider a fictional multiple integral equation that is flawed trope and a serious joke in an effort to picture what an intersectional or interactional theory might look like in Terrapolis. Think of this formalism as the mathematics of SF. SF is that potent material semiotic sign for the riches of speculative fabulation, speculative feminism, science fiction, science fact, science fantasy, and I suggest string figures, end of quote. In this formula, for possible worlds that look like and follow the logics of playful string figures, she evokes cosmic constellations of the Navajo people, the Inuit people, and the 21st century cyborgs reliant on signs in the night sky. Therapolis demands a slowness that rubs against the grain of accelerationist neurosis of the capitalocene, a speed that the people of the Mauna Kea know all too well with the rays to wreck the gigantic telescopes on their sacred volcano. It also evokes of images of other indigenous struggles like the warrior Masawa women, defenders of the water bodies of the highlands of Mexico, the same bodies I shared with countless migrant monarch butterflies every year between November and March for the best part of my own childhood. But we don't have to have ties to the indigenous or native people, their symbionts or spirit animals in the struggles that, uh, that uh, lead them to defend their lands precisely because we share, we share their situatedness as Terrans. We are all of this earth and must stay with the trouble. We must learn the subtle arts of living on a damaged, unfinished, imperfect planet together, as Anad Singh reminds us. Therapolis, and I dare to say that all of Donna Haraway's body of work, her SF contributes greatly to the making of the compost upon which our earthly survival depends. Knowing that this has been done ad nauseum, I am like Britney Spears and I can't help but do it again. But more than all this, I think what matters it, it really matters who it is that we imagine when we imagine a we. So to conclude the question of this presentation, namely what architecture can learn from the peculiar, unique Harawayan philosophies, I see this we, namely architecture and the multiple and varied publics that we as architects interact with, human and non-human, organic, inorganic, technological, environmental alike. I also see that for architecture, the horizon is always already the irreducibility of organism and environment. Perhaps architecture is lagging behind other speculative design approaches and practices, and is too quick to believe the God trick disguised in the sustainability discourse, complete with its greenwashed attitudes to, ecolo to ecology and the environment. Clumsily or selectively perhaps, ignoring its transhumanist undertones. Although perhaps it would be simpler to look at the work of other feminist philosophers of science, such as Rosy Braidotti, Kat Hales, or Karen Barat, to make the post-humanist argument, I do think that Donna Haraway provides us with methods and tools to imagine possible worlds and alternatives that are not necessarily spatialized and that go beyond the way that we try and tiresome dystopia, utopia, heterotopia trilogy. In other words, and to conclude, a future other than the Terminator style one where neither technoscience nor the humans that co-created prevail over the rest of this planet. Haraway reminds us that other alternatives are always steering and are always possible. But for now, I take these views from somewhere and someone, be it worm, bird, and human, and pass the word on to Bob. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank, thanks, Heidi. Um, fabulous. Um, Bob, let's, let's go straight to you. We'll have some questions at the end. That was, that was great. A lot of a lot of suggestions there for questions, I think. Thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering if we were doing a five minute break, but it's okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the invite and for the possibility to uh, say something more about Haraway's work. And of course, also thank you, uh, Heidi, for this wonderful uh, situated situating of, of uh, Haraway's work in a broader context. Um, so maybe to introduce myself, my name is Bob and I work as a lecturer and currently I'm also working uh, on several courses where I'm trying to elaborate a number of concepts uh, from various authors, including Haraway, that help us to think with and think through basically what architecture does 
and how it does so as a material discursive practice, as Heidi has already mentioned, and to rethink architecture and the built environment also in terms of these welding practices. And to do that, I want to uh, basically elaborate today um, the uh, concept. For some reason, I cannot share my. Yeah, sorry, we should, um, we need to let you uh, be a co-host. Uh, no, you should be able to uh, share the screen. I've done the settings. Can you try? Uh... Yes, now it works. Yeah. I hope you're able to see my presentation. Yes. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to do is, in some sense, to rethink what architecture does as a material welding practice through uh, Haraway's book, Staying with the Trouble, and in a sense, staying with this book for a while, and instead of uh, having, let's say, the broad scope of Haraway's work, to just basically start to think through one of these arguments and to do so with a central chapter on sympoiesis in this book. And I also want to do that more in a kind of a free association mode without, let's say, a scripted lecture. So please also feel free if you have questions in the meantime to raise your hand. And then I'm also happy to address certain points directly, uh, maybe rather than afterwards. And of course, as a very big disclaimer, as Heidi already mentioned, uh, I think what should be said is also to be wary, since we're not talking necessarily about, let's say, a classical philosophical concept here, and uh, kind of an ontological uh, uh, concept or something that comes from the history of philosophy, one should be wary of using, let's say, a concept from evolutionary biology and apply that directly onto architecture and the built environment. Because, of course, architecture is said to be very different, to, to be constituted different. Architecture is not typically considered a living system or not yet. Um, and... In that regard, there is something else in some sense where architecture is peripheral to this. It is more a system that engages life, but then as uh, the philosopher of technology, Bernard Stiegler says, by means other than life. So there's something where architecture produces a kind of life that is often falsely uh, distinguished as nature. And it becomes augmented by or into something else that is then often falsely called culture and technology, and therefore precisely falls already into, let's say, Haraway's contestation of nature and culture being two different things, but something that needs to be thought on a spectrum. And they also need to be considered as co-constitutive, actually. And it is this, with this question of co-constitutiveness in mind, uh, and with my personal interest in assemblage theory and then process ontologies, to understand uh, basically the evolution of architecture, of architectural form, that has led me to embrace Haraway's work and use this radically sympoietic lens when I investigate how forms of architecture and subjectivity co-emerge. And it is also then from that kind of perspective that I employ, let's say, a wider range of feminist, queer, and decolonial theories and methodologies without which, let's say, as attendant discourses, thinking such is, is kind of a, a, just becomes a hermeneutic exercise of trying to understand what Haraway means, but it doesn't necessarily help us in the sense of applying it to architectural thinking and uh, architectural production. So I basically want to go through the chapter as it is written with you reading out some of these kind of thoughts and, and making some kind of comments on that. And the one thing is, of course, directly that the beginning of the chapter states that sympoiesis is a very simple word. It basically means making with. The contestation is that nothing makes itself. Nothing is really autopoietic or self-organizing. In the words of the... Uh, of the Inupiat computer world game, Earthlings are never alone. That is the radical implication of sympoiesis. Sympoiesis is a word proper to complex, dynamic, responsive, situated historical system. It is a word for worlding with in company. Sympoiesis enfolds autopoiesis and generatively unfurls and extends it. That condenses in some sense the entire argument what it is for but like I want to let's say explicate that over the next 30 minutes with you the first thing that Haraway at the end of the page uh, in a sense 
directly argues is that sympoietic arrangements are otherwise known as cells, organisms, or ecological assemblages. And that is exactly the, let's say, the kind of additional layer that that word is adding in contrast to what you already argued in terms of autopoiesis, which is this word that you probably know is coined by Maturana and Varela in terms of a reference to systems that are capable of producing and maintaining themselves by creating their own parts and their own conditions, actually. So, and therefore, you encounter them under the idea of self-generative processes of self-organization processes. Against that, they actually also produce something else, which is important for it, which is the idea of allopoiesis, which is a process whereby a system produces something other than the system itself. So, for example, that's important to understand how life emerges from non-life or non-living things. So it is, in a sense, the production not by the self, but by something else. And that very idea, of course, is taken up and developed in Deleuze and Gattari's idea of heterogenesis, where heterogenesis tries to bring these two notions together. And it's, so to say, the genesis, the coming about of something different, but by means of difference. So difference is the main operator in the system and not the parts, because the difference are, uh, let's say, the differentially produced. And that means the difference precedes the parts and it also precedes, so to say, the becoming different of the system. In the work of Haraway, this idea then becomes directly related again to organic beings, how organic beings come about that we consider, let's say, as selves. But the interesting thing is that they're considered also, let's say, historically as one or individual entities. And that has, in a sense, shaped the entire way we think about things. And that has also tinted the idea of autopoiesis as something that emerges when we talk about, let's say, selves, that they're, in a sense, one or individual. And against that, she promotes this idea of a holobiont, which is basically holos means like the entirety, bios is like a living entity. And so to say the idea that beings are composed of something, smaller parts, and how they work together. That we know, of course. But then the crucial point is that these holobionts hold together contingently in complex patternings. And in these complex patternings, in some sense, she argues that critters do not precede their relatings. So the cells, the organs, they do not precede their relatings, they co-emerge. This makes each other, uh, they make each other through semiotic material involution, not evolution, involution, out of the beings that previously were entangled in this becoming. And that is exactly where, let's say, the, the boiled down notion of sympoiesis becomes a becoming with each other. So it's the process of becoming with each other. As Heidi already mentioned, this idea refers back to the work of Lynn Margulis. Lynn Margulis has, for example, developed this idea of holobions for these symbiotic assemblages and has also, with the Gaia theory, uh, promoted the idea of that this idea is scalable. Uh, in some sense, across larger formations, larger assemblages, um, and the way that they form dynamic complex systems. And here, in quoting or discussing Margulis, uh, Haraway talks about those as intraactive relatings in dynamic complex systems, and that refers us uh, to Karen Barat, whom I'm going to talk about later, uh, in that, in a sense, there is we need a specific modality to think about these relationships as preceding the parts in order to understand how they come about. And that's, in a sense, the idea how we reconsider entities, or let's say assemblages, as something that is made up of bounded units, but they're not necessarily interacting, but how do they actually gather into something else? Sorry, Robert, we don't see the slides changing. You don't see the slides changing? Yeah. So you're still stuck on the first? Yes, just on the cover page, yeah. Let me try to reshare it. Yeah, now we see chapter three. I should be able to share. Do you see the change now? Uh, no. Do you mind uh, just stop sharing and sharing it again? Okay. Mm. 
Yeah, you should be able to try now. I've just stopped sharing for you. Does it work right now? Uh, it's on the PDF. Do you want to just do full screen? That's what I tried, but then you said you don't see it. Yeah, now it's full screen. Do you mind just changing the slide a bit? It's on chapter three. Yeah, now it's now it's working. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Apologies. Sorry. Yeah. I should have asked. So I was basically going through these slides here. Um, I'm gonna show them slowly again. And I was basically here right now. So in reference to Margulis's work, I think the idea that Haraway then distinguishes is the idea that uh, Margulis has promoted was the idea of symbiogenesis. So um, in some sense, uh, starting from the idea of symbiosis, Haraway contests here in the first section that symbiosis is not to be misunderstood as being mutually beneficial, something that in a sense is uh, often connoted to that term. But what happens is that symbiosis has to be understood as an evolutionary process. And in this regard, Haraway refers here to Margulis's work as a radical evolutionary theorist, uh, whose first and most intense loves were with bacteria and archaea, and how they basically, in some sense, started to collaborate. And the core of Margulis's view of life was that new kinds of cells, tissues, organs, and species evolve primarily through the long-lasting intimacy of strangers. The fusion of genomes and symbiosis, followed by natural selection with a very modest role for mutation as a motor of system level change, leads to increasingly complex level of good enough quasi-individuality to get through the day or the aeon. Margulis called this basic and mortal life-making process symbiogenesis. And based on, let's say, the same image um, that, that Heidi used, uh, here's still the idea of, let's say, symbiogenesis, meaning, so to say, together life and the origin is the leading evolutionary theory, especially of the origin of mitosing eukaryotic cells from prokaryotic organisms, that's archaea and bacteria. And it holds that organelles of uh, cells that have multiple uh, cores, basically, like mitochondria, originated when bacteria folded inside another cell through processes that are called endosymbiosis. So endo meaning coming inside, symbiosis basically means one bacterium tried to eat another bacterium, but it, gotten, it didn't get properly digested, but continued to live in it. And that is, so to say, the idea how the first mitochondria are formed. And then with plants, you have also cyanobacteria that then enter the cell. And then, for example, there was a mutualistic loop between the cyanobacteria producing, um, what is it, ATP or something, and then uh, becoming, so to say, the uh, becoming kind of a, a machine in themselves. And that started to bring these cells in like a specific evolutionary direction. And that's this process of endosymbiosis is not exactly depicted in this image that's called endosymbiosis, homage to uh, Lynn Margulis. Um, but it is, so to say, the beginning of when we have, let's say, not smaller uni unicellular organisms, but multicellular organisms, or let's say cells with subcomponents that then have new evolutionary potentials. Of course, that is an evolutionary theory, and that in itself is not necessarily applicable to architecture. Perhaps it is in some ways if we think about certain room types of furniture. Um, but generally, let's say, it is a way of thinking about something. It is a way that contests that things basically don't just evolve, but there is a certain interaction or intraaction that brings these things about. And that's exactly where, let's say, um, in the spirit of Gaia theory, in the spirit of thinking about increasingly complex systems, Haraway promotes this idea of uh, sympoiesis rather than autopoiesis as a new way of thinking about something to understand, let's say, the interlocked and multi-level systemic processes of non-reductionist organization. 
So it's not about the parts, but it's about their interaction and how they basically maintain and make themselves and make each other unique. And then the critique that in a sense Haraway brings in is that Margulis still called these notions autopoietic because the notion of sympoietic hasn't surfaced yet, but suggests that you would have been a fan and would have embraced this idea very much so um, to in some sense understand that there is a certain uh, relationship between these components coming together and producing something else. And in that regard, uh, Haraway also wants to maintain that these things shouldn't be understood in opposition, but let's say autopoiesis would encompass sympoiesis and allopoiesis in some sense together. Haraway is also, let's say, very generous in always acknowledging people with similar parallel thoughts. In some sense, the interaction that she had in, let's say, coining the idea of going from symbiogenesis to, let's say, the idea of sympoiesis and the way that, that Beth Dempster had uh, already promoted this idea for collectively producing systems that have uh, that do not have self-defined spatial or temporal boundaries. Instead, information and control are distributed among components. The, system, uh, the systems are evolutionary and have the potential for surprising change. And that, by contrast, autopoietic systems are self-producing autonomous units with self-defined boundaries, typically, that tend to be understood as centrally controlled, homeostatic, and predictable. And in this regard, symbios symbiosis, symbiosis makes trouble for autopoiesis. And uh, symbiogenesis is an even bigger troublemaker for the idea of self-organizing individual units and the way that basically it's an anthropomorphic concept or an individualistic concept that's imposed onto cells, uh, the selfish gene or those kind of ideas. The more ubiquitous symbiogenesis seems to be in living beings, dynamic organizations, processes, the more looped, the more braided, outreaching, involuted, and sympoietic is Terran worlding. And that's exactly where this idea opens up uh, through this idea of that things, in a sense, have to come together to produce something new. If we do that and we take the critique serious, especially concerning architectural discourse, of course, we have a lot of discussions about autopoiesis in architecture, specifically when it comes to the generation of form. And that, in a sense, is exactly this critique or this idea. If we would think about, if we would take a sympoietic angle on that, we would always understand the material from which it is composed, the things that it recomposes, so, or the figurations, as Heidi already mentions, that are being reconstituted and recomposed in the process. And I think that's exactly, let's say, if it is true that neither biology or philosophy are longer supports for uh, the notion of independent organisms and environment, that is interacting units plus context, then sympoiesis is the name of the game and the game is intraaction. That means to summarize in some sense this passage that sympoiesis is the idea that nothing ever makes itself. Rather, producing one thing requires that initially there's two that enter into a relationship, and in this process, they enter into a mutualistic becoming that produces something new. And let's say two is just the minimum basis for it. So that means what is basically going on in all sorts of evolution, and you can imply that, of course, to the idea of history, is not that, the is not that what's happening is the making of an emergent self, but a becoming with that is a making with. And it is in this making that sympoiesis presents a mode of systemic relationality, bringing us back to the idea that relation, relations precede the parts, through which all sorts of uh, systems then evolve by way of coupled processes. And they're always, let's say, synergistically coupled in a way that is not mutually beneficial, but it's synergistic. So there is a certain kind of evolutionary benefit to these systems maintaining themselves. Okay, I noted this disclaimer about the privacy uh, primacy of relations several times, and that is something that, let's say, Donna Haraway had pioneered and uh, in the idea of um, the way that uh, processes are material and semiotic at the same time. And that, in a sense, uh, that it aims uh, is a concept that aims to portray that the object of knowledge as an active meaning generating part of an apparatus of bodily production. 
That, in some sense, means that boundaries between parts, when they interact, materialize only in social interactions. So they negotiate it. And that means boundaries are always drawn by mapping practices, in some sense, practices where one thing is mapped onto another or where they combine. And in this process, their differences are articulated. And that, in some sense, leads Haraway to have uh, posited and situated knowledge that objects never pre-exist as such. Also within the wider epistemological argument that the article makes that objectives, in some sense, research objectives never pre-exist. They need to be elaborated based precisely by drawing things into relation. That means objects and objectives are basically boundary uh, projects. Their boundaries shift from within, and boundaries are very tricky because they're provisionally, uh, they provisionally contain uh, remains of generative, productive, and meanings of bodies. This point is then taken up by Karen Barat. Um, in, in uh, specifically in posthumanist performativity, understanding uh, towards an understanding of how matter comes to matter, and the subsequent book, uh, Meeting the Universe Halfway. In this, uh, based on Haraway and Foucault also, Barat argues that things only come to matter in processes where both their matter reality and meaning is mutually articulated in the same instance. So that also means that neither discursive practices nor material phenomena are either ontologically or epistemologically prior. So that means in some sense that we cannot say like Foucault sometimes did that a certain phenomenon precedes the way a statement was made about it or that the statement in some sense had a new kind of agency uh, in shaping new knowledges, but it's basically in the moment that this thing is co-articulated, that something that can be thought differently and has maybe a different type of being or becoming is co-occurring in the same time. So let's say even on, an, let's say all the discussions previously about biology were mostly more on an ontological layer, but let's say also the epistemological layer, how oh, we create knowledge about that falls uh, under a kind of sympoietic lens. That means neither basically has any kind of privileged status in determining the other and neither can explain the other two. So it's not that uh, the chicken and the egg situation. Um, so we have to, uh, like from a sympoietic lens, uh, we would understand, let's say that X as some sort of cell type precedes any type of being in some sense and so on. And therefore the entire question would be posed the other way around. That is... The idea that then relationships, for example, uh, what we could call what an egg does, for example, uh, in regards to an interior or an exterior that is then constituted by that shell, is gaining as a relation a primacy over the relata they bring about, which would be the inside and the outside, or the chicken and the egg. And that is exactly where those things, in a sense, only emerge as part of their entangled intra-relatings. And it's, of course, exactly in this word that Haraway specifically refers in this kind of internal dialogue with, with Karan Bharat uh, and argues in some sense from this idea uh, how these boundaries are constantly re redrawn within a field that is already populated by productive forces and material bodies. From that angle, that challenges us to stop thinking about objects, you know, not just like atoms or things and objects and bodies and figurations. They're never pre-existing um, and they're never exactly pre-existing the relations into which they can enter and not the relationships from which they are constituted. So rather specifically figurations are something that is simultaneously constituted by as well constituting virtual relations with which these things come about, come to be named, come to be actualized, come to be expressed, and so on and so on. What does that mean? In a sense, the first thing that uh, is, is relevant to the entire argument about sympoiesis and staying with this troubling idea of how things basically evolve is that we have to couple a with 
to whatever is happening, be it a becoming, be it thinking. We can only become with something else. I become with food, with light. I become differently because the sunlight hits me right now and I'm getting a little bit warm here. Um, I can only have new ideas when encountering something, like a new problem, a new author, a new concept. And I think with these people, I think with their arguments. So also like thought becoming doesn't occur out of itself. If that is true, then the question is basically, uh, by leaving the individual behind, uh, leaving also the humanist ideas that lie behind it behind, that this other that shapes my becoming and thinking needs to be accounted for in anything, let's say, that is problematized in this regard. And therefore, let's say the idea where um, this idea from Haraway crosses into the field of architecture, in my view, goes through uh, the wider field of more than human studies or post-human studies, such as developed by uh, Braidotti that uh, Heidi has already mentioned. The very simplest way to bring these things together is through, for example, uh, the idea of nested assemblages, as, as promulgated by Delanda's work, for example, or um, for example, I have, let's say, some, some kind of reading readings here, if you're interested in this, um, how we basically go from this more than human, post-human uh, idea um, towards uh, theories of the environment. And that is, so to say, going through post-human ecologies. And that is because I want to problematize something that Heidi has also already touched on. And that is, on the one hand, uh, the potential danger in misunderstanding post-humanism as a new paradigm in the Anthropocene and entering specific types of uh, relationships. And to understand, let's say, so to say, the co-constitutive nature in this. There is, of course, a lot of radically relational uh, ideas about the built environment already out there from uh, Pat Raw's books on uh, edited uh, anthology from relational architectural ecologies and how basically architecture is also to be thought in terms of the relationship that it produces. That, of course, is also uh, elaborated on in uh, Andre's uh, book um, with a focus specifically on, let's say, uh, the ontological dimensions about territorialization, how territorialization is, for example, exactly this kind of um, production of a certain kind of selection of an entity through certain components or so, and how they, in a sense, produce certain assemblages that then do specific things that can be understood in terms of architecture as, an, as, an, as a form, uh, in terms of the formation of architecture. But it can also, as Helene Fischot argues, be through Stenger's work, be thought of architecture as a practice, or even the theorization, the practice of theorizing architecture, where those are ecologies that bring about new things. As architects, we tend to invent or try to invent new things. So therefore, they are, in a sense, creative. But there is also a process of selection that is, in a sense, critical where these critical and creative processes actually shape these kind of new entities and what they're able to do, which is very interesting, very complicated, of course, but it is exactly this complexity that then explains, for example, why all these formations have different capacities, different affordances, and can do different things. And the relationship they also enter with, let's say, certain cultures and certain humans. And that is exactly where the Anthropocene in some sense comes in, because let's say uh, as much these two books are, let's say, just a small selection from, let's say, an entire discourse that's out there that questions basically, or where now, let's say, uh, we can start to question to what degree we are human or we become human through design. Um, opens up a lot of these questions. What is then the new role for architecture? What is the new role for design that than architecture has in these kind of processes. Within the context of the Anthropocene, that shifts a little bit the focus. It is not so much, let's say, the idea that the Earth is designed and how we become, how it has to be designed differently, how it has to become differently to maintain, let's say, human action, but specifically in, let's say, decolonial feminist discourses, the question is actually opened up and deflected from understanding the Anthropocene also as a symbiotic or symbiotic construct. Um, the question is just what is produced in this context. 
And uh, for example, Catherine Yusuf also in, in a kind of dialogue with Haraway argues that maybe the better way is to question this entire process in terms of anthropogenesis. So the production of the human, how are we made human? And in that regard also, who is made less human through certain assemblages or um, what sort of human to bring it, let's say, to the work of Sylvia Winter is produced in this process by whom, by what assemblages, by what environments also. And uh, that kind of question brings us then, of course, back to, let's say, this nature culture divide um, as supposedly a continuum. And the increasing question of technology, which is, so to say, the third component which is traditionally divided from it, um, but which also needs to be understood as, let's say, basically different aspects of the same thing. If we think about these things, how basically uh, Anthropos is produced, then uh, several scholars will argue that there is certain techniques involved, not just practices, but techniques, techniques of becoming human. And these techniques then shape certain evolutionary processes. And that um, is, so to say, one of my primary concerns together with Andre's work also, where we were investigating, for example, through a sympoetic lens, the work of um, uh, Bernard Stiegler here again, who has coined this idea of epiphylogenesis, uh, which I'm not gonna explain a lot, but it's basically the idea of a technical co-evolution. So Stiegler extends the idea of sympoiesis onto a technological realm. And then questioning, so to say, what sort of development evolution are we entering with technology in the Anthropocene or in these recent times? And then uh, we investigate here specifically Stiegler's call to develop um, a general organology, as he calls it, which he basically does by mechanologizing Atari's three ecologies that argue for the fact that, let's say, nature, the social, and the technological are one and the same thing, or at least that architecture lies at the intersection of them, and um, generalize that idea, so to say, and uh, make it a kind of a machinic ecology in some sense to figure out what it does with us. What sort of, um, what is this kind of machinic assemblage through which, let's say, what we call nature evolves into something that is in a sense more cultural or more technological in terms of environments. And if we do that, uh, we can basically also map how technologies and technicized environments from books to the organization of cities enable certain becomings or also individuations or power relations. We can then also ask how these relation patterns certain ways of thinking and what Stiegler calls noetic life. I think Heidi had already referred to the idea of noesis and that was also mentioned last week. So there is something where with technology and if we understand the built environment as a technology, uh, or at least as a technicized environment, then we understand that there is a recursive loop between it. If we think about the development of cities, you know, like the, the idea that uh, cities have produced a certain type of civilization. So there is a recursive loop, a sympoetic becoming between a certain type of environment and with the forms of life that it produces. And in this regard, it's very interesting to figure out the relationship between the form of the built environment and the form of subjectivity that co-emerges with these environments. And that's exactly, let's say, where sympoetically, epiphylogenetically, I think architecture has something to add to this discussion. The discussion currently happens more on the level of, let's say, digital technologies and how these newer technologies become increasingly disindividuating, disempowering and toxic. But then again, I think we also have a good genealogy of architectures from um, prisons to plantations to uh, camps where these kind of disindividuating assemblages have already, let's say, had a specific um, sympoetic function for the evolution of certain political systems, economic systems, and so on, social systems. So that brings us basically back to the question about the organization of environments, which Haraway and Stiegler would argue is always technical, and how that becomes an apparatus in the sense that also Barat argues um, that produces certain subjects and subjectivities. 
So in Stiegler, this uh, Stiegler calls this a retentional dispositif uh, in the sense that built environments retain traces of the past and these traces of the past, how they come to be inscribed in the organization of life, still condition and organize the present and also present becomings. And therefore, what they do in this inscription is basically they lead us into past dependent evolutions. And that always reminds me of Sarah Ahmed's idea of that the more a path is walked, the more a path is walked. So they, in a sense, they niche us into a specific type of um, yeah, evolution or becoming. And that requests then, in some sense, to, to open up this question again. And what is very interesting about these kind of uh, how basically then built environments lead also to some sort of echo chamber where they basically reproduce the same. So there are several books, for example, on the social reproduction of architecture, or how architecture helps reproduce certain social structures. And that question, of course, is very specific, but it can be broadened up, I think, in, in a decolonial context, um, so to say, with or a feminist and decolonial context, how we think about those kind of things. And very interesting, just like yesterday, uh, I uh, read Bembe's The Earthly Community, and I was very surprised to see that, let's say, the idea of a general ecology uh, that is promoted in, uh, for example, also Stiegler's work, um, is promoted in there as a way to think about uh, our being together in this kind of anthropocene condition. And parallel to Ramon Amaro's work um, and his extension of Simon Don towards a critique of the black technical object, Bembe engages uh, with Simon Don's reading of technical evolution to question how a certain type of technology, and that is namely a transhumanist uh, understanding of technology, turns into a new type of religion and infinite progress, and so to say, siding with the idea of the Anthropocene or the Symbiocene brings back all this kind of what Bradotti would call neo-humanist BS um, that shapes our planetary becoming, uh, specifically in the third millennium. And the interesting thing there is, of course, then that if we uh, cite uh, Bemba and Amaro, then with others like uh, Wendy Wei Kyung Chung on uh, discriminating data, or Luciana Parisi and Ezekiel Dixon Roman's work on recursive colonialism, then we also understand that this uh, way of understanding technology uh, presents a major source of further discrimination and dehumanization based on its biased algorithms that perpetuate uh, uh, colonial logics because they're precisely a retentional dispositif. They're carried over from the past and they still structure the present. And we're still becoming with these outdated structures. I think that's the main argument that I want to make. And that's, in a sense, a very interesting thing where, for example, then with uh, Yuk Wei's work or so, we can precisely think about and think with Haraway how we evolve with certain techniques and that first may require that we question the very idea of technology in favor of multiple cosmotechnics. As Heidi already mentioned, there's different types of worlding practices out there or were there in the past, and they're all mediated by different cosmotechnics. So our notion of technology, what it does with the world, how it guides our thinking, how we become with this way of technology has to be provincialized. It's a very specific way of thinking that cannot be universally applied. And therefore, let's say the claim towards an Anthropocene, a Symbiocene or a Symtechnocene or whatever in this transhumanist discourse is, is basically bypassing all the other possibilities for other possible worlds. So the, re the question is then exactly how do we open up this way of thinking with technology, becoming with technology, towards a new idea of worlding, how certain worlds come to be, how they come to be constituted, but specifically how they come to be instituted, where and for whom. And I think um, then to, to end there, um, I think this brings us maybe back to one of Haraway's most famous quotes about rather being a cyborg than a goddess, which of course initially sounds a little bit esoteric perhaps or something, but, um, or as esoteric as the goddess would be, but like, what, what does it mean today? What does it mean concerning this kind of cyborgian idea? I think it has something to do with the fact that um, in some sense, the, the god, rather than the cyborg being the transhuman, I think it is actually the goddess 
the way that current technology becomes elevated on this kind of pseudo religious level, um, undermining all of Simondon's work, basically going back to a magical state in the belief of infinite progress, that where let's say the esoteric element, the universalizing element, like also the maybe the minor itches we get from Gaian theory or pantheism or something, they all come back because they fundamentally overshadow the particular type of co-evolution that we enter in the cyborgian stance. And that means basically that the cyborg is actually the true post-humanist stance. The goddess would be the transgressive, the trans uh, transhumanist idea of it. Um, or the transcendent idea of technology as the developing uh, factor. And that's exactly where the cyborg is more the figuration that we could investigate our becoming cyborg. How do we become with AI algorithms, uh, implants, uh, hormones that we ingest, uh, microplastics, and so on? Um, because they are on the level where, as, as Jose Bradotti would say, we may be in this condition together, but then based on our subjectivity and our positionality, we're not one and the same. So they require exactly what Haraway has always argued for a situated perspective from where we speak, what we can do, where we can do certain things, make certain kind of contributions to these things, and also elaborate them collectively and together. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> that was an amazing, um, if it was unscripted, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> so God knows what, when you're scripted, what was going to happen? That's uh, very impressive. Okay. Um, I think there are lots of uh, different sort of questions that came up there. A lot of you covered, both of you covered a huge amount of, of territory. Um, uh, and can I just simply say that those who are watching on, on, um, uh, on YouTube, please um, feel free to, to send in um, Send it, send in a question. Um, maybe I can just kick, kick things off. I guess I'm, I'm not as familiar as um, with Donna Haraway's precise writings as either of you. And I was when I was uh, reading around, but I noticed that she had been criticized for being a little bit vague in the way the terminology that she was using, and 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 difficult to pin down in some sense. And it's it's kind of intriguing that she is both straddling, well, she's straddling the world of science and straddling the world of the arts. Um, which have got very different kind of, I guess, discourses in the way they're presented. Science tends to follow the scientific method, and so on and so on. Anyway, it's it's there's a there's that, and I I maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, perhaps I could put the, to this question: Do it, it, it did, do you find that her work is a little imprecise? Well, what I notice is is basically one way to really begin to sound her out is by constructing this kind of scaffolding, as it were. I mean, there were these. I think figures that you kind of referred to Varela and Gattari and, and Stiegler, Simon Don, Margolis and Bridotti and all those figures, that allows you to kind of situate uh, Donna Haraway's work. Um, and I've, I've not so often seen Haraway herself quoted um, and I often see quotes from the others. I mean, is, is, is that charge of being a little bit vague? Is that, is that, uh, is that, um, is that, is that, does it, is that fair or, or do you think it, uh, she holds her own as a kind of a, a, a rigorous internal thinker. You go back, Bobby, you do it. I, I was about to ask you if you wanted to go first. Um, I think it has something, I would, I would first say she is quoted a lot. Uh, she's quoted a lot in, I think, a different type of um, arguments. And the arguments are often made precisely, for example, let's say the way you phrase the question, it assumes where, where you say the vagueness also, it has something to do with, I think what in situated knowledges she would critique as objectivity. And um, some of the things I think that I also love from her that I haven't talked on is of course, the, something that also Barat developed is uh, the, the critique of this objectivity through reflection. And then in Barat, it is, let's say, developed into a diffractive lens. So where meaning emerges in patterns of dissonance or consonance. And in a sense, what makes it, let's say, difficult to quote Haraway out of context is um, in a sense that it's not the same type of universalizing claims that are stated in sentences that can be easily 
let's say stolen and then made buildings off or so um, but it has something to do with the way that the text constructs a specific type of argument a specific logic that becomes only clear once you quote it at length once you read it together with other things and therefore i think it invites us towards a very different modality of thinking um, that is in a sense not this uh, Heidi, how do we call this like a sort of uh, pick and choose or something nor the we have a colleague that would use the idea of corroboration so I'm not citing a philosopher or biologist to corroborate my uh, um, vegetative performative museum design in some sense but um, of course it would inform how I fundamentally think about the relationship between these kind of things and that makes it in a sense, I think what she invites us rather like than quotes is a certain idea of citational practice. Let's say the feminist idea that it is who do you relate to, whose, whose traditions do you build on? And I think in a sense, that's where it's not about making these kind of bigger claims, but in a sense, creating networks, e ecologies of thinking and so on. And I'm going to say I'm personally always very happy to just jump into these ecologies and see what's out there. And I prefer them, actually. They're my preferred habitat. Yeah, I, I, I'm doing this from a more perhaps a, a, where I'm, I feel more comfortable also because of my tradition. And so I'm more on the discourse analysis side. Um, there are two up to up to this moment, there are two uh, uh, actual books that work only on Haraway's uh, knowledge, right? So all the rest is just, uh, you know, recooked. Uh, she has written about the cyborg, I think over 20 different articles. So they appear in all kinds of different publications. And there are two, uh, as of date, two companions, so, uh, volumes that are about Haraway, uh, for Haraway, on Haraway, rather than by Haraway. And uh, I think this is very telling, first of all, because I think Donna Haraway is a very interesting figure also for feminist uh, scholarship. Um, and I underline the scholarship part is not that because you don't pertain to a certain identifiable uh, school or, like I said before, a, a, a stream or a, or a school of uh, philosophy or or science or technology or whatever. Uh, you are this, you know, disqualified because you don't have the rigor of that uh, kind of uh, tradition. So I think that she is like her cyborg and a lot of the figurations that she works with. She's a pioneer. She breaks ground. Uh, she has broken the ground. Uh, for a lot of others to come uh, right after. And, and she also points out what I think is really interesting, um, uh, an interesting kind of side, uh, a sidekick of Donna Haraway is that she also allows for that hidden and repressed in some way suppressed way of being a feminine a feminist scholar and also a female scholar uh, to exist, to rise, to, to, to at some point become visible. And she does this uh, in, I think, very elegant ways. So that that's one of the things. There is one um, recent, I think it's 2019, if I'm not mistaken. So I did do my job here. I did I did check on all the things that were uh, that were published. No, it's actually 10 years old. It's called Beyond the Cyborg: Adventures with Donna Haraway, it's Margaret uh, Grebovitz, and um, and Helen Merrick. Uh, where the where the main point that that they are making is that Haraway has become the figure of the erasure, the systematic erasure uh, of feminist scholars in citation and quotation, um, in other words, in, in critical apparatuses. So how that erasure works uh, and how this the, the, the opposite of that erasure becomes a project of feminist scholarship. So to work both with and against that erasure. So I think uh, Donna Arway has done uh, really, really fantastic work in not letting herself be erased and, and not to jump in the race of being published. Like, uh, I think Karen, Karen Barat, for instance, has a, a more, um, perhaps a more situated position also within the sciences and Rossi Braidotti within the humanities and the social sciences. But yeah, that, that I think is partly what uh, Donna Haraway shows us. She's a hybrid of many, many different hats. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't go under also. She yeah, not in, in a second, I was going to bring, bring Yi in, but, uh, to, to, who's a question, but can I just maybe just raise another issue there in the sense that the, um, I mean, the danger when you make a hybrid is that you collapse the differences, you bring together and you don't recognize the differences. There's a, there's a beautiful article in Rethinking Architecture by Georg Zimmel, where he talks about the bridge and the door. And, you know, the bridge is that which connects 
what is separated and the door is that which divides what is connected. And they're almost two way. He's not really talking about bridges and doors. He's talking about two ways of thinking, you know, and as soon as you bring together two things, you see the differences between them. And I, I'm always reminded of the moment when the, um, Brett Steele introduced Peter Eisenman and Rem Kohlhaas at the AA for a discussion. And the way he introduced them, they, they look like identical. He said, well, they, they do similar buildings, similar, they write lots of books and whatever, blah, 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 blah. And when you saw them together, you just noticed the huge differences in some ways. And I, I think that in some ways, you know, that, that the, the, the challenge there when you're dealing with this kind of um, not blurring, but overcoming differences is actually is, is in a sense that, that, that something's been lost in that equation. And there's and there's a there's a potential violence in just connecting things when the context to which you're operating often is is gives a different meaning a different uh, semantic meaning to what to the to the subject matter so i i don't know I'm, I'm i'm always a little nervous about that of just kind of collapsing and bringing together different disciplines and then raising differences is, is that a fair critique i'm pretty sure bob you can do better you can do better much better than me because i have to recollect what i want to say i'm also post-structuralist so i have to think very carefully what... <laughs> I, I don't know Mm. I don't have it. I don't have the answer on the spot right now. Um, I think personally, if if you would give me that assignment as another paper, I would think about hybridity. What sort of hybridity am I applying to this judgment? Um, and then maybe consider her an assemblage on her mm -hmm. own. Um, so it's again, it's not. Uh, let's say the critique that I made about parts being pre-constituted to the relations hybrid, it sounds like there's a part, there's a part, I mix them and it's a mixture. Hybrids for me don't really exist. If it's a new assemblage that produces its own, that's exactly her, let's say her transversal uh, feminist uh, biologist turned philosopher of uh, uh, science. Uh, um, genealogy line that is singular and in its singularity, it is it in a sense, it erases actually these parts because they're no longer relevant. I don't need I don't need biology anymore. I don't need this to judge it, and therefore for me they don't become the the basis on which I can hybridize her. I think it's in a sense um, let's say that's what I'm trying to understand. Let's say post structuralistically or so in some sense what what is produced in that becoming that is Donna Haraway. You know, you, you finished that, uh, Bob, you finished your 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 uh, presentation with a really nice phrase. Of, uh, it's also one of the most quoted uh, phrases of uh, Donna to be a cyborg, like to rather be a cyborg than to be a goddess. And I think many people believe or think that the cyborg is inherently a, a, hy a hybrid of sorts. Um, partly of my interest in monsters, for instance, I had to express it as an interest in monsters as ambivalent or ambiguous and as the discrete object of something that was very difficult to explain, which was the process itself, the process of uh, the process that creates or generates or by which things emerge rather than, than, um, than uh, how can I say it, rather than the hybridization process. Right? So it's, it's in the end result that we always are like uh, wanting to look at. So when we need to make these distinctions of what is a cyborg, right, and, and to look into whether a cyborg is a combination of organs and, and a cybernetic material, and, you know, we try to think in terms of uh, putting things together rather than to put them apart. Um, so that's, it's a difficult, it's, it's kind of difficult, uh, um, a difficult operation, mental operation. Like like you, Bob, I would also have to, you know, take another two weeks to go back to my <laughs> try to answer your question, Neil. But uh, I don't know if it's a question or it's actually a position, a position of knowing. There are moments where we're making uh, making these clear cut boundary uh, claims. Um, uh, it is in the boundary. It is in the border. That actual disciplines emerge, for example, or it is in the framing of the inside and outside that a wall appears, rather than rather than the wall always being there in our heads. It's something appears by us thinking uh, in making that um, that gesture of separation or of of, of connection. Uh, but it's not the sense of walling or bridging that we do this in in advance. So I, I don't know. Yeah, there is actually a, a comment by Foucault, and I can't remember exactly what it is now, but it's something like as you cross the threshold, uh, it kind of, um, 
you were aware of the threshold as threshold, you know, rather than just de de denying it. And I think that's the interesting thing is to be able to tease out those differences either side of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Yi, you've got your, uh, Yi's got a hand up, as it were, a digital hand. You'd like to um, ask your question? Yes. Yes, thanks for all of the professors. The wonderful lectures for the poster human series about the heroin. And you know, you all of you, you mentioned that all of this point I agreed. And she used the cyborg to encourage the, the families to push beyond the tradition gender rules and embrace a more fluid understanding of the matters or even which kind of matters identity. She argues that the boundaries between the humans and the animals and the nature artificial and the technology or high technology or AI with the relationship, intense relationship with the human are becoming increasingly uh, blurred in the contemporary world. Therefore, it's very clear that as all of you suggest that we should embrace the possibility uh, offered by these changes uh, in our world and the challenges about the tradition limitations. So I have a very interesting question for all of you as the most recent news in Italy just happened yesterday here. The government, the Italy government has found the chat GPT as the first Western countries to do that way. So as the users in Italy, even the students was not allowed uh, at the architecture school, and that's very clear that not allowed can use the uh, AI uh, website anymore. So uh, how are you thinking about the action and how we encourage the people, especially encourage the authorities as the power structures can collaborate with the chat chat GPT or any of the AI software rather than against it or ban it or see it as the negative things. So as the report also uh, mentioned as, as your presentations before, uh, you said, I agree about that point. I can only have new ideas when encoding something like a new things. So new matters, we don't have new ideas. We, uh, when we not uh, have the chance to encourage or face the new matters or new problems. And uh, Heidi also said, we as architecture, we should, we, ha we have the responsibility to interactions with the human or post as the post human body. Right, so that's my first question. And I have the uh, second question for Reboards. <laughs> well, maybe maybe we'll just speak to the first question first and then we can move on. Okay, to okay, okay. So, so. <laughs> I don't know if it, if I can answer this, uh, uh, answer it. I think it is a very uh, provoking uh, thought that you bring forward, if I, if I understood this correctly. Um, Look, the advantage of being over 50 is that uh, that I can remember a time when uh, we would actually use pants. We didn't have computers. We communicated by telephone. So I remember the the first uh, the first kind of uh, discussions about how it was uh, made uh, public. These ideas of uh, of the personal computer and so on. So I remember very well what the technophobic uh, reactions were to everything that uh, seemed to come from uh, from uh, advanced techno sciences. Uh, that were either either seen by the champions of technology as, as, uh, as the techno fix for the next problem uh, and by the, the more conservative population, but like relieve really it with phobia, with fear for, for the unknown. So I suppose that what you're saying here, it was very funny actually that, that you mentioned the chat GPG because um, I was, I was uh, explaining a couple of weeks ago that I was, I was gonna make this, uh, this talk and uh, to a friend of mine who sent me by email a text I said, hey, how did you get my notes? You no, know, I just I asked uh, this uh, software a question and look what it came up with. It The text was literally, Donna Haraway has no connection to architecture. In a very nice academic way, it was written, Donna Haraway and architecture are not friends. You know, the, she has not crossed that, uh, that line, right? So there's nothing specific yeah. about, um, about her uh, writings on, on, on architecture. Um, so I thought, 
the, the, the whole point of this kind of software is not that we don't know how to think or that we will become lazy or that we will become increasingly dumb or although I do think there's a component to that. It is that it will challenge us to ask the right questions. So it's about identifying what is problematic about something. So it depends very much what you what kind of information you want to extract from that uh, from that uh, technology, that specific technology. So imagine, I don't know, now we're talking about this software that supposedly thinks for us and writes these beautiful texts. But it, I don't think there's a very big difference with a sling, you know, with the with the with the, or a hammer. It depends very much what what that is that you actually uh, put into that technology to see what it comes out. So that's the first uh, of the bad kind of uh, reaction that I have to your to your to your question. And secondly. It would be just a matter also to thinking about censorship. So I always would be, would be very, how do you say this, very suspicious of govern, governments and, and uh, let's say authorities or author, institutions of authority to take a stance on certain technologies like that. I'm thinking TikTok in, in, the, in the US and, and China and so on. But it does have uh, to do with the much deeper ideas of uh, techno governance. So Again, I think I, I would have to take some time to really think about what I would answer in, in this regard. But um, um, let's see if Bob has something better to 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 tell you about this. That's a great. That's great. I think I would have. You, you took away my two points, so <laughs> I think it also I would have maybe just added that. Let's say a known problem about it is, in a sense, how do you make it create novelty? Because let's say, uh, based on let's say the typical question, it perpetuates or rehashes certain information, and then it has a certain degree of convenience or something. But let's say I think also Stavros mentioned that last time it doesn't really it isn't able to produce a new interesting problem. Um, so it will give answers. In a sense, we also train the mechanism to do that. And in a sense, it falls into, let's say, rather than, let's say, this technophobic reaction from the government, I think the interesting thing about it is, in a sense, that it asks us, like, what do you want from this technology? Or what do we want from artificial intelligence in some sense? Uh, writing emails for us is like that that respond to auto-generated phone calls and then these machines talk with each other and we can well I'm happy with that no but um it doesn't it doesn't actually it doesn't it, it's basically it doesn't fulfill the capacities that it has for actually creating uh, new synaptic connections relationships between something that we may not know because we are too stuck in certain ways of thinking and so it's about let's say this kind of weird triangulation in some sense about let's say the expressions and the statements that it produces and what they're used for that is just not unproductive and that in a sense you know like that's also exactly why this kind of uh, process of techno governance kicks exactly in because it's exactly the same it's, it's like it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy but yeah, I agree just, with you, actually. Just just well, one thing, Robert, just kind of throw out an idea out there. That is to say, um, certainly in, in Benjamin's work, you get the case where mm -hmm. certain, I mean, he was obviously, photography was the issue then rather than AI. And there's certain words that begin to kind of permeate his discourse, you know, the magnesium powder, flash bulb kind of thing, the, the snapshot of the bourgeoisie. And, you know, not that they have agency, but I think once you get these, these, these tools and their affordances, it maybe opens up new ways of thinking about the world. And I kind of suspect that, like Google, I guess, and I think that literally, I mean, not well, not literally, but 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 indirectly, I guess, that the logic of the search has begun to permeate how we think and and so on and so on. So I'm just wondering whether 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 Chat GPT might have that possibility of. of doing that uh, I, and I would just simply say just as I, I think I made the point last time that I think these things I think they misunderstood they search and synthesize they do not reproduce in any way um the, these these things so anyway, that's a longer discussion we'll go into that now but yeah maybe just whether whether it might open up new ways of thinking or new possibilities of, of thinking and, and making some sort uh, some parts of the of the labor uh, process uh, irrelevant so what we call support systems I mean if if a, if a software can do that for me, like uh, you say, answering emails or uh, filling out, uh, um, I don't know, taxonomies of things that already exist, fine. This is actually going to uh, augment the time that we have for other types of, uh, of activities, perhaps more cognitively rich activities. Um,
you, do, do you have another you have an, your second question yeah i have a second second questions for robert as you mentioned a paper from david landy and he write a paper as you should uh, on your presentation as being hypersity and the post human body so my questions would be related with as uh, the city become bigger city as uh, become the hyper city and the, uh, as us as a human being become uh, like the cyborg so how you think how we doing as the architectures uh, roles and being like the useful uh, what, no matter what's the practice or as the scholars the uh, work to being a hyper cityist and thinking about the, the yeah post human body is the related with uh, our work it's a good question <laughs> um <laughs> also deserves its own paper I think I would also, again, you know, I'm a genealogist, so I would reel it back to the origins of cities and how they made us different humans to begin with. You know? And let's say it's just another step in the same development. So like you had you had the bourgeoisie emerging in, in, uh, uh, in Osman's Paris, and uh, th then what type of subject are these hyper cities now producing? And how is that different from uh, um, certain areas say in tokyo 20 years ago or something or a times square so it's not something new but like again as with the question of the hybrid or something what do we mean by hyper what is this new type of relationship that then produces a new type of subject it's not a simple question that's literally something you can write an entire phd on um, and there is no simple answer for it because it remains in this kind of conceptual deadlock that I think I can call a universal condition hyper, and therefore it produces a certain type of subject. While there's probably so many types of hyper, which just means beyond something, beyond something that is, let's say, a stochastic means or something, whatever, where, what does it do? Like, you know, uh, Byung Chul Han would say it makes us like crazy. So, like, we all get burned out. Um, and then you can bring in an entire, let's say, bibliography on sick building syndromes and so on and investigate how we disindividuate with these types of environments. But that's a very different discourse that you would have on maybe, let's say, city planning and uh, technological augmentation or something. Or if, let's say, uh, Amazon goes even more crazy or whatever like you know like even even within that you need to choose what sort of becoming with do you actually focus on and investigate and then you will have different answers depending on that okay thank you thank you for your wonderful response okay we have a um, just a question from uh, Michael Just and also um one from uh, Vasco who his mic is not working, so I'll read that. But maybe, Michael, would you like to? Um, yeah. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful, really excellent presentations. I enjoyed it very much. And also for the more general work that you've been publishing out of TU Delft, which I found super inspirational and I've, I've been following closely over, over time. Um, I have a, I'm very interested in this. In this um, sort of um, complementarity and overlap between Haraway and Stigler. And um, let's say in light of, of, um, of this notion of diversification that I think Stigler was, particularly in his later years, very, very interested in. Like, now, someone like Yukui, right, in his notion of cosmotechnics, which is closely related as well, has turned to the uh, has turned to someone like Viveros um, in, the, uh, in the work of Viveros on the Ara uh, the Amazon. Right context, and for um, for for the Aravite, the um, humanity is a is a universal condition, but very different from let's say humanism in that in that from from the Amerindian perspective, um, everything is. I suppose this is more this is this may be too general, but I suppose I suppose animals have been human from that perspective. Now I wonder if we. If we think about anthropogenesis and let's say design as producing the human, to which extent is there 
or can we think of a remnant of a of a universal human? Do we need to retain that to a certain extent? Should I go first, Heidi? Yes, and then we have to plan our second uh, seminar. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, wow. Um, very difficult question and a huge field of contestation because, again, it hinges on what do you mean by the human and who enunciates this human. Um, I My personal thought right now is, no, we don't need the human. Um, like at least not in this idea that winter criticizes as like human 1.0 and human 2.0, we don't need human 3.0. We don't need to define it constantly because it will never be based on its, let's say, ratcheting that as Andre mentioned last week, it will not be inclusive enough to talk about all humans. Um, on the level of species, I think, yes, of course, there's something undeniably and so on, but then maybe we need to find like a different way and talk about hominization or so like the like anthropogenesis is, let's say, the critical process that complements homo, uh, what was the word again? <laughs> uh, homi hominization. So hominization is basically the, the speciation process in which the species homo has evolved based on actually the confluence of different branched off entities. And that's why we still have, let's say, uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA in us, and they make us more resilient to high altitudes or whatever. So it's not like this kind of thing that there is this one thing called human to begin with. Um, and uh, at least at least what is, what is then the original genealogy from it? Uh, so in its inherent difference, if we even understand the human in its inherent difference, then it has to include also, let's say, the colonial racialized history with which it has been used uh, to make other people uh, more than half the pop population less than human. No? Um, and in some sense, I think we need this notion for the critique. We need the human to effectuate its own critique of its insufficiency while maintaining something else that in a sense is, so to say, um, species specific without resulting in speciesism again, um, where again, let's say we shouldn't, we shouldn't understand ourselves as fundamentally different, you know, like in the way that beavers build dams and ants build anthills, so that even like in Stiegler's work, the idea of anthropogenesis is even relatively reductive uh, and a little bit problematic, that in a sense that use of works is much more encompassing. And so on, I think it's about that. So it's not a simple either or question again, but what can we think with the human and what do we become with the human or where do we start to disindividuate still? And I think that's why the post-human is a good uh, is a good place to start. Because it will take I, th I think it will take uh, a lot a lot of uh, mental evolution to be able to finally and fundamentally let go, or to assign this kind of figuration because we're very obsessed with that uh, figuration to assign it to a certain condition, the condition of humanness. But if we want to like like Haraway and so many other feminists are already urging us for 20, 30, 50 years is to move away from that, not in an, in, in, you know, not in the, in this kind of a, um, in this kind of a, a, a move to break away what we already have, but in order to, to move on, to move beyond, to continue, you know, th and that is what I think the human is not allowing very well. So this kind of hiccup with, with the categories, um, the post-human allows us to think through and to move across that, um, that condition of being human. But yeah, it's, it's, it's it's again another seminar. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'll leave. I'll leave room for other questions. This is a wonderful topic, but yeah, let's go on. <laughs> thank you. So there's a question here. I want to read out Vasco's question. Vasco is in in, in Bangladesh, and uh, uh, we can probably see him there, Vasco. But his microphone's not working, so let me just read read it out for him. Uh, I think this is actually a good a good question, just in point of clarification. How does Haraway's work on technology and science intersect with feminist theory and activism? Oof. How? 
I mean, I, I have to say that I also had a, a similar background concern. They kind of collapsed together. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, just to go beyond that, that, that just conflation, what, what, how, you know, how could we just, you know, tease out the differences and things? I think, let's say, where it becomes activist is it yeah. tries to make an argument that yeah. reclaims the fundamental difference in the way human thought can be structured and that based on that, let's say cosmological almost dimension, certain epistemological assumptions are made that then as Mignolo also argues, instate or institutionalize certain ontologies. And then there is a certain link, a self-fulfilling prophecy that is created from that. For example, the fact, the belief that, you know, um, that there are certain parts pre-existing and they can be objectively described and that our laws guiding them and how that has created an entire philosophy of science that then tries to explain the world that works to a certain extent, but that it loses sight of the fact that most cosmologies start from relationships. And it's not about, let's say, a, a kind of an oppositional stance, but it's about, let's say, the, the activism comes just in this other way of knowing. and. Um, the fact that, let's say, it is constantly diminished from, let's say, the based or let's say based or shoved aside on the argument of objectivity or also, as Gustavo argues, based on relativism, because they don't get, let's say, the dif difference between relativism and relationality or radical relationality. Relativism also already presumes that there are certain parts that are already there or there's a truth out there. And in a way that there, we think that there are molecules and atoms out there, there are parts that can be described. We also never think about the way those are enunciated. That's actually an argument from Minolo that I'm just borrowing right now, not from Haraway. But I think, I think it explains a little bit where, let's say, Haraway's fundamental work on that situatedness comes in. The situatedness is, of course, developed on, let's say, long-standing theories of feminist standpoint theory, for example. So there's a very clear relation how, let's say, standpoint theory translates into a new or different type of epistemology that then calls for a new kind of ontology, how we look at the world. And that it's plural, that we care for these others, that it's not about critique, but entering in resonance pattern, and that we think with these differences, rather than classifying them and then creating hierarchies. But, you know, like that's, I think, it's, a, it's a, again, a very complicated question that needs to be reeled back a lot to understand Um it's not Haraway's work that is intersected with feminist theory and activism, but in the sense that it's a lot of, let's say, male stream scholarship that's intersected with heteropatriarchy. You know, it's like on the same level. And it's not about the activism, but then it's about the normativity that is in there. So, and again, it, it has to be contextualized. It has to be situated. And then it doesn't become relativist. It becomes from where I speak. I see things differently. I am in a different process. I'm in a different argument. With the caveat, perhaps, that it's not entirely contextual, as we would like to understand it. It's also constitutive of other things. You know, it, it sets the ground that the, it, it allows for other things to happen. But again, this is a question that starts with how, how and how questions are very complicated there's not an easy answer to to how does that uh, intersect i mean i don't think it intersects i think it is part and parcel of the same um uh, uh, operation maybe i could just uh, i've just got a particular question for for robert and, and maybe i'm completely off off of theme here but um i i've been interested in the past on in the kind of the question of homeostasis and um uh, I've got a um, I've got a student actually who's doing a PhD um, on neuroscience, looking at the work of Antonio Damasio, who's interested in, in that. And then you also have um, the theme of homeostasis is kind of central to, for example, uh, some of the cybernetic arguments about the brain, Ashby and so on. Um, so there's a kind of and, and what I've always wondered if that self-regulating and I understand that a cybernetic thing is is kind of cut off from the outside and therefore limited in some sense. But the principle of homeostasis you know could possibly move into the area of 
of Varela and so on, opening up to the ecology around. Uh, could could one make a comparison between the, con the of Gaia as a kind of concept, a homeostatic concept, and homeostasis itself? Is that would that be legitimate? Legitimate? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's just let's say. Um, again, with this kind of context, with a concept, it requires a context. So homeostasis in itself is not like a bad term or something. Mm -hmm. it, it has something. The question is, how is homeostasis produced? What does it do? So and then we start to acknowledge homeostasis is produced in a heterogeneous system where things interact. And homeostasis is basically a process where the system is able to maintain itself. So we label like autopoiesis, this process where this self is or you know, maintains to be, but let's say what Haraway would argue is we have to look at the dynamics. And then my actual point is I would refer to the work of Terence Deacon, um, where it's not about homeostasis, but homeodynamisms. Homeodynamisms are basically then precisely naming the ecologies, the flows that allow this thing to not die. Um, but then Deacon's work, for example, also directly argues that this doesn't constitute life. Life needs like a second layer where these dynamisms are basically, that you need dynamisms that keep the dynamisms in the homeo dynamism. And so there are several layers, again, nested assemblages of these dynamisms. And at some point, there's something where these things are then actually able to um, continue for a certain time metastably to generate themselves. And that requires basically to not think the cells in a kind of void or so, but they have to be thought in a material milieu that's always uh, a milieu that's always material, that's energetically saturated. You have to think it like as an ecology where things are basically constantly um, in interaction with themselves, interacting. And in a sense, then um, the, the understand it also as a systematic effect, what is regulated? So let's say if you think about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, they're constantly basically in a kind of uh, balancing process and all is fine. This is a certain state, this is a certain state, and this is a certain state, but then homeostasis is more like this rather than the fixity of it. And that's why in a sense, it's always like, how do we think with these kind of concepts? And then uh, exactly like, how do you think about stasis again? Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. Actually, I actually like that term homeo Was it dynamic? I forget what it was. Dynamics. I, dynamics. I guess the point was that it's, it's homeo rather similar rather than homo same. It's going. I think that was the the kind mm. of argument behind it. But it, I, I absolutely I totally agree. It's about a balancing device. And just for those of you who maybe don't are not familiar with the term, I just want to just mention that uh, Damasio used it to talk about how the brain operates, not as a a kind of command command control system, but rather a, a self-regulating balancing device, almost like a thermostat that you know you get too worked out, the brain too worked up, the brain kind of calms you down and so on. Um, so anyway, it, but I do I have I, so I've I've been intrigued by that connection in some way, but it's not made explicitly. Um, yeah, yeah. We we can I mean we've gone on for for. For, I mean, this has been an amazing session. It's been really action-packed. There is so much material here, um, so much material here that I could imagine, you know, someone just launching on a, on their PhD would start start off with a kind of this background material and 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 all these kind of prompts and triggers and whatever else. So I think it it, it opens up a huge um, domain, and it also I think connects in an interesting way so many other thinkers that we've been we've touched on in the past, and and some whom. Clearly, we need to touch on in the future. I mean, I think it seems that uh, Stiegler is somebody. Stiegler actually gave his last lecture on digital futures um, before he committed suicide. So, you know, we should maybe revisit him um, in some way. But anyway, this has been a. I, I think we should need to wrap up now, just for the time being. But I, I hope that we'll will this is to be continued in many ways. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of throw out a, a kind of a thought um, to go back to this kind of ecologies thing that that, that Robbie you've been been well, both of you've been focusing on. And that is to say that, you know, in some ways, um, what happens when you create a platform for these kind of interactions is that you get a kind of ecology developing. I mean, I often thought about as a kind of global brain, but you get this kind of very immediate feedback and it, it actually starts producing new forms of knowledge that we hadn't thought about before, but actually it's so immediate. Um, and, and it brings together literally everyone from around the world. I mean, some of the people today are all over the world. It's, it's great to be able to do this, but 
I was just want to throw that out there. And I, I guess that it kind of, um, I'm not quite sure what the word would be for the, the ancient Greek for, for um, because Latin is putare. In fact, the word computation means to think together, actually. But what would, what would the Greek be? Sin something, something where you're kind of operating together. But I really get the feeling that this is, this is, uh, been a kind of an ecology when we've been we've been been sharing ideas and thinking together in a, in a certain way so a hugely hugely productive session um so anyway let me just kind of just do, we, let's wrap things up but thank you thank you so much um uh robert and heidi i'm kind of i was speculating while you were talking especially in, in the light of um of, of last week's terrific session with stavros and, and, and andre whether in the future we're going to be talking about the Delft School, just as we talked about, about the, the Frankfurt School or something else in the past. But certainly what you've got going there seems to be a real melting pot of ideas. And I really I find it uh, intriguing and, and hugely productive. Um, so I'm just going to say that we've got people here from China, from Iraq, from uh, from Bangladesh, just in this discussion, Iran, in this discussion. And uh, um, it's it's been been a, a wonderful thing we will we'll upload this on, on the youtube and let's just see it as not a discrete entity on its own but rather as continually part of a dialogue uh, its own kind of um ecology that's going to carry on for the future so we've got uh, um a couple of more sessions to come i'm particularly looking forward to yulia kristeva partly because heidi's chastised me because we think he didn't have enough female voices in there earlier on uh, but she's someone i i actually went to her seminars in, in, in columbia someone i admire hugely and then we end up with um a, an intriguing session on, on tafuri where i think we i suspect we're going to get people Chiora telling us no no philosophers uh, architects can't learn from philosophy and we'll get, get, get the other side we get louisa saying yes they can i i i think it's a mixed question i think sometimes there's a lot of misunderstandings going on that architects always have what Harold Bloom calls a creative misunderstanding of philosophy. They take a term like the fold and get completely wrong. But at the same time, I do think there's been incredibly useful um, interventions by philosophers. And I would say that that Adorno versus uh, Adolf Luss and, 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 and Derrida's uh, commentary on, on Shumi and, and, and Frampton's, com uh, oh, sorry, Jameson's commentary on Frampton and all that stuff in Rethinking Architecture was hugely useful as a corrective, as a critique, as a as a powerful tool. And I really think that we've been, in terms of our outlook on on the the, the environment as a whole, not just architecture, but landscape architecture and everything, we've actually been enriched by these 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 ideas today. And I think we're we're um it's really giving us much uh, some critical tools to think with. And I think that's the word to, to think with. So thank you so much, uh, Robert and, and Heidi. Thank you to the audience here. Thank you also to the Digital Futures team behind the scene, to Bavlin and others who are doing all this work to make this happen. And uh, and, and thank you to those who, who, who are watching and other videos and things. Let's hope it's going to create some kind of shared um, understanding that will, will only make the world a better place. So um, thank you, Robert. Please come and join us for other sessions. I would love to hear more. And I certainly want to bring you guys back in for something else in the future. It's been a really stimulating session today. So thank you so much indeed. And thank you also to those asking in questions today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you, professors. Thank you.